Let us convene. Good uh, morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody. There's some background noise. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Okay, maybe stop now. Very good. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Sandra Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as chair of this study and of this committee meeting. On behalf of the, of the National Academies, I'd like to welcome everybody. This task being undertaken by this committee of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine includes reviewing the evidence linking social and digital media use with health outcomes in adolescents. This full task is posted on the study website. I want to note that it is an open on the record session. Interested individuals and members of the press may be attending as observers. This is not a news conference, however, and will not be entertaining questions from the floor. Reporters who would like to talk with committee members are kindly asked to touch base with the study director, Jillian Buckley. Jillian's contact information is also on the study website. Um, I would also like to remind everybody this is an information gathering session that is the committee's in the process of assembling materials that it will examine and discuss in the course of making its findings, conclusions, and recommendations. Therefore, I ask everyone here today to be extremely mindful of the fact that the committee has made no conclusions. It would be a mistake for anyone to leave here thinking otherwise. Committees, uh, comments made by individuals, including committee members, should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or of the National Academies. In addition, committee members typically ask probing questions in these information gathering sessions that may not be indicative of their personal views. The committee will deliberately uh, will deliberate thoroughly before writing its draft report. Moreover, once the draft report is written, it will go through a rigorous review by experts who are anonymous to the committee, and the committee then must respond to this review with appropriate revisions that adequately satisfy the National Academies Report Review Committee and the National Academies of Science president before it is considered an official National Academies report. Finally, I will remind our speakers and guests that comments post pasted in the chat will be considered submissions to the committee and saved in a study file that members of the public can access. Please be mindful if you would like to share any pre-publication study findings or other confidential comments that this is a public forum and the comments are also public. Having said all those formal things, let me just say um, on a bit more human level, it's wonderful to be here with you all. Thank you all for joining us and thank you in particular to the committee members who have done many of these hearings and to our guests for joining us today. So we have a number of speakers um, we're going to hear from in the next uh, um, hour or so, and we're going to start with uh, from uh, Professor Diraj Murthy, Professor in the School of Journalism and Department of Sociology at the University of Texas at Austin. Professor Murthy, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. Uh, can everyone see them okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. That's perfect. Wonderful. Thank you. So my name is Diraj Murthy. I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Austin and director of the Computational Media Lab. I'm going to be kicking off uh, today's uh, event speaking about platform accountability. Um, a lot of this is based on a work that's been published, and I'll share the URL later so that you're able to take a look at it if you want to read uh, things in more detail. Um, so platform accountability in some senses is a fairly complex um, space, but I've tried to keep it in summary here to emphasize some of the, the, the key points I've done in my particular work of platform accountability, but also to kind of simply get us to ask and think about how well do social media platforms really manage, moderate, uh, and curate content online. And on the other hand, um, how are some methods to prevent or remove harmful content and user accounts. So here are things you know, around moderation um, and specific forms of intervention. Some of this uh, in terms of platform accountability can be done on an automated basis. Um, some of you probably heard the term ethical AI, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and some of these done, are done through manual content moderation systems um, as well. So in terms of what we are actually um, thinking of in terms of platform accountability comes the idea of what are actually social platforms, because the ecosystem is actually changing quite a bit of what platforms we actually want to hold uh, accountable out there. There's different forms of technology that are emerging. So what we used to think of as, as you know, new media isn't so new anymore. And then there are more emergent media coming out that are very new and some haven't even heard of it. Um, so I think it's kind of useful for us to reflect on the sort of entities or platforms we should think about making accountable in the first place and thinking about you know, potentially studying in terms of accountability. So some of the characteristics I think are extremely useful for us to think about in a sense are um, entities um, in terms of platforms that are profile-based. So if we can create profiles, 
they can be public profiles or, or private. If we have systems of friends um, and, and followers and other sort of um, networks in terms of feeds, um, comments and posting. So if we can go in there and we can, you know, um, create our own um, uh, original content, um, I think that's part of um, what what constitutes a social platform. And again, I'm providing a very broad, you know, definition, and not not everyone agrees with this characterization, but I think it's really useful in terms of creating accountability frameworks, um, social networks. So our ability to network with others, those who we may already know, um, but those who may also be unknown to us. This goes in a system of kind of degrees um, of, of separation. So not just first degree networks, but also extending to second degree connections, third degree connections, and so on. Providing us really with venues or spaces um, for social interaction, um, for us to be able to engage, that could be in very different ways. So it could be through augmented reality, um, it could be through text interactions, it could be through video sharing, um, it could be through a lot of different mechanisms. So I kind of want to take a very broad definition um, of that. Very importantly, um, it's spaces to really build social relationships. Um, as, as a sociologist, fundamentally, that's what I think a lot of, of what's happening in terms of the platforms we want to hold accountable um, are trying to do is build those relationships. Obviously, there's there's commodification to them of, of, of why these platforms are growing so rapidly. I also think it's really important to emphasize um, that it's both public and private platforms um, that we want to think about um, here um, as uh, uh, social platforms and ones that we should hold uh, accountable. Um, in a sense, these are not always obvious. So we, we, we think of the platforms we should be holding accountable lots of times as you know, Facebook and, 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 and Twitter. But I also want to make the case, and I will during this talk, that uh, messaging platforms like WhatsApp um, are, are definitely fall into the space of social platforms that we want to hold accountable. We've seen huge spreads of misinformation, disinformation on, on, on particularly on WhatsApp. Video sharing platforms like YouTube, which I'm going to talk about a lot today, um, and, and my case study is particular on YouTube. What are called, and, and this is my terming of it, authentic sharing platforms. Um, some of you may be familiar with the very emergent French platform, Be Real, um, but also Snapchat falls under this category. And I've, I've done work also making the argument that payment platforms such as Venmo, which has had very public feeds, um, are also social media platforms that we need to be uh, thinking about holding accountable and uh, doing moderation um, you know, audits of. So in a sense, um, I'm thinking about accountability here very broadly, um, and in a sense, I hope that helps us open the debate or discussion or thinking um, today in terms of accountability and some of the um, future directions we can take in this area um, as well. So why accountability at the end of the day? Um, I, I really enjoyed reading um, the, the readout of the White House listening session on tech platform accountability, which happened in September. A, a brief quote here, I think, helps set the stage of, of partially my interest in the space. And it's, it's, it's this, although tech platforms can help us get, help keep us connected, create a vibrant marketplace of ideas and open up new opportunities for bringing products and services to market, they can also divide us and wreak serious real world harms. And in a way, that's a, a, a big reason for me doing uh, this sort of work and why I think platform accountability is tremendously important. So in a way, that's, that's kind of providing a background of where I'm coming from uh, today. Um, in a sense, I think one of the, 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 the things that's really important for us to think about is accountability is actually really tough. And I briefly want to talk about why it is so tough. I think there's a couple of ways for us to think about it. One of the reasons why it's so tough is that it's difficult to conduct accountability assessments of tech companies. That's, that's the bottom line, uh, at least from an academic perspective, if you're not embedded within a tech company. First of all, algorithms are extremely complex and confusing. Um, even, even to experts, even to people who are trained you know, in engineering and computational spaces as, as, as someone who comes from a technical you know, background, I still find it really difficult. 
There's also explicit code-based barriers to transparency. These are either the ways in which the code is designed, and I'll talk about in the specific case of YouTube, how much line, how many lines of code there is to actually parse through, um, but also um, the fact that um, the coding itself can create um, barriers or walls in that there can be many programmers or many groups of programmers who are putting these things together. So transparency um, isn't always on the agenda here. Um, another uh, you know, term that, that we always hear, I shouldn't say always, but often in regards to algorithms is that algorithms really are, are, are proprietary. They can be the engine um, economically of what's driving a social media platform, but also it's the subject of patents. It's the subject of a lot of the intellectual um, you know, and, and economic worth of some of these systems. The term we often hear applied to social media, media algorithms is that they're a black box. They're not always the case. There's published papers, sometimes preprints, um, members of research teams from these platforms that describe the algorithms, but we're just kind of getting a surface view often um, of how they work. We don't actually know all the inputs that are taken in to make you know, determinations and make recommendations. Another thing is algorithms are not neutral. They're driven by multiple factors. They need to be useful to users or users will leave these social platforms. They generally need to be economically viable or hyper profitable in some cases. They may also have a particular agendas, whether they're socio-political or otherwise. Um, so we have particular platforms, say a platform like Truth Social, um, which is explicitly framed as not being neutral. What does this mean for accountability? at the end of the day, well, it means quite a few things. Most importantly, it means that we don't have transparency or accessibility. We often don't have APIs, application programming interfaces, um, to engage with social media platforms. And very recently, just this week, um, uh, Twitter has uh, turned its API that has been um, free for researchers to access for many, many years. I've been accessing it since the, the beginning of my research career to being paid. So there is a lot more barriers that are being created, not just from the algorithmic side, but even the engagement with the platforms. So some of the things that I'm trying to unpack here are that we ultimately about algorithms and social platforms have a lack of transparencies. So we can't necessarily go in and say, hey, we'd like all the code here and scrutinize the algorithms. So it tends to be something that people internally within platforms are able to you know, look at. And even sometimes internally, they can't fully scrutinize things, again, because of the complexity of code or the fact that multiple groups are working on things, or that if they were to mess with things, it could break an algorithm. Ultimately, this lack of transparency creates barriers to meaningful accountability at the end of the day. And I think that is the reason why in academic scholarship, we've had a lot of work that's broadly been termed in the space of critical algorithm studies. And I think one of, one of the big takeaways, and I put some authors who are involved in the space um, at, at the bottom of the slide, um, but algorithms are, are seen in critical algorithm studies as potentially being problematic because they can adversely impact um, you know, our life. And it, it, it's, it's kind of provides us with ways to think about in a way of what makes them problematic. So the next slide, I'm just gonna provide one quote. I think that's kind of helpful to understanding this. And um, critical algorithm studies, ultimately at the end of the day, seeks to open the black box of processors and arcane algorithms to understand how lines and routines of code work in the world by instructing various technologies how to act. And I think um, Kitchen, and Dodge work, Kitchen and Dodge's work here is really helpful in the sense that we're thinking about um, code as, as, as really providing that instruction. But if we don't have transparency to those lines of code and what's providing instruction, it's hard to actually often hold platforms accountable. In a way, we're seeing what's generated by the algorithms and trying to make guesses often 
of why we see those things operating um, from the end point. So in a way it's, you know, chicken and egg. Um, and we don't really know in some ways what is coming first sometimes in these algorithms. All we can see sometimes is the results of them. So I would like to spend some time now talking about my own work. I have put um, a, a short tiny URL to my actual published um, study there. So those of you who want to read the study more in depth are welcome uh, to do that. So I'm going to talk today about a case study of YouTube where I conducted um, some platform accountability um, here, despite some of these complexities of a lack of transparency, etc. So the first thing of YouTube, YouTube isn't always a platform that has been studied historically. It's one of the things that made me really interested in it. Um, part of the reason why is YouTube is always kind of changing its algorithms. And this quote from YouTube, which isn't online anymore, um, it was put up by YouTube some years ago and then taken down. But YouTube in this, um, when it was online, stated, we run hundreds of experiments each year to make sure this, referring to its recommendation system, and every other discovery feature is, is better and current algorithms will change over time. So in a way, I want to highlight that not just YouTube, but most social media platforms are always changing. Um, they're, 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 they're kind of always evolving, if you see it from that perspective, but at least always changing. So I found that in the particular case of YouTube, that was something I had to work with. YouTube's algorithms are also well known to be complex. So um, Christos Goodrow, an engineering director at YouTube, noted way back in 2014, so I have no idea what the state is nine years later, but it takes over 1 million lines of code to figure out what videos to recommend. So when we go into YouTube or other platforms and it's kind of seamless, same thing in a system like Netflix, there are sometimes millions of lines of code operating here. So we're dealing with extremely, extremely complex systems. And YouTube's algorithms ultimately are designed to make content accessible, but that sometimes has issues. And I think Newman's quote here is really helpful, that YouTube remained um, uh, easy to find content on YouTube that violated the company's uh, community guidelines against hate speech and or explicitly promoted terrorism. This is something that encouraged you know, government and other stakeholders to take action and put pressure on YouTube. Of course. Now, this is a screenshot that I took on my phone, um, and it kind of gives you an intro to why I got into this work. Um, so when, at the time, you can't do this anymore, and if you did, your phone would probably be flagged for various things. But if you started typing in, let's go for A and put in J-I, on my phone, it completed, let's go for Jihad. Um, so this idea that YouTube's algorithms even suggested extreme content was something that made me really curious and wanted me to try to make YouTube accountable or to check what's happening or to make a case that there were problematic things happening here. And journalists had been making this case, so I wanted to go through and find some evidence and try to understand what was happening from the algorithm's perspective here. Part of this was part of large-scale public calls for accountability and uh, President Barack Obama suggested that technology companies need to work to silence ISIS online and make alternative accounts to ISIS's narrative accountable. Journalists had gone through and found numerous cases on YouTube of the system recommending content from ISIS to sometimes users who weren't even explicitly looking for this type of content. So ultimately, I've said YouTube's an extremely complex space. I could take any other social media platform and tell you the, exactly the same thing. Millions of lines of code, lack of transparency, black box algorithms, all these sort of issues. So I wanna briefly say that even though I painted this picture that it's really difficult to engage in platform accountability, I also wanna make an argument that it is possible and absolutely should be done. So I wanna use my case study as an example about how we can do that. So in this case, I was able to um, create a platform accountability study of YouTube, despite the use of a black box algorithm, which still, I don't know exactly how it functions. 
I don't try to claim that in my article, but what I do try to do in the article and um, was able to do was build a method of platform accountability through reverse engineering, or at least my best attempts to do reverse engineering to try to collect data relevant and try to make some conclusions that again, I can't draw absolute conclusions in terms of causality or anything else, but can paint some pictures in terms of what was happening, um, not just by conducting searches through YouTube, but also doing large scale data analysis. So YouTube was found by journalists. And again, all the screenshots here were things that um, I found. The study, as mentioned, uses um, uh, Tor browsers. So I'm using encrypted browser sessions through, anonymous, through the anonymous Tor network um, and was able to find YouTube as a source of extremist content. I will say part of what the study does is then I come back and look for this content years later and YouTube has taken it down. So it's a bit of a spoiler alert, but I'll talk about that. Um, but ISIS um, was actively recruiting through the platform in terms of what journalistic reports showed us. And again, as I um, show here in this image, uh, Mujah tweets is one of um, ISIS's official tweet sized um, videos that they kind of did. So there were short content to try to um, encourage recruitment and promote radicalization. Um, so these videos were the reason why it has so few views is because these videos were often taken down by YouTube and then they were reposted. So what I did in this study is I built a video network. And I used um, in this network 15, a little over 15,000 um, uh, 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 videos um, within my initial seed network, and then created a larger network with um, 190,087 video recommendations. And what I wanted to do within this work was identify videos recommending ISIS content. Um, ultimately, I was trying to look at accountability because journalists were saying that um, people were going on to YouTube and being exposed to radical content. So I actually wanted to try to understand the ecosystem or network um, of how these recommendations were occurring. So some of the things just um, with a couple of minutes I have left to give you a very, very brief um, kind of idea of what I found. And again, the study goes into a lot of detail about this, is that actually I found some cues are really easily identifiable. And again, I'm my work is specific here in terms of YouTube, but this can be applied to a lot of different platforms. I found that a lot of the videos that were recommending um, uh, ISIS content were found in particular genres on YouTube. For example, in the people and blogs category and the news and politics. And the green part um, of the bar graph are videos that are recommending um, ISIS content. A lot of them were very recent, again, because of the fact that it, I'm not trying to make the argument that YouTube was terrible at platform moderation. It was taking down content um, that was uh, uh, deemed to be terrorist related, but new content was being posted. So in many ways, the algorithmic checks we're not able to keep track of things. Many were also newscasts, and most of them tended to be in English. Furthermore, some cues I found to be very predictable. So most videos recommending ISIS content on YouTube had easily identifiable traits. Some of them have had radical keywords, but some also use words or phrases that were from ISIS videos. If you see towards the right, of this example still, again, is still from my work, you'll see No Respite FR MP4 360, which is an official ISIS video um, that they put out. So the fact that this video had No Respite in the title then recommended um, uh, terrorist, extreme terrorist content. So some of these things are not um, that difficult to kind of see once we create these sort of platform accountability studies. So ultimately, at the end of the day, YouTube did make some improvements over time, I found. And my study actually looks um, initially what YouTube looked like and then came back years later. It was initiatives such as the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, Google's Jigsaw, for example, and other mechanisms enabled YouTube to, over time, take down much more of this content. As my article shows, some of the content that I could see back in 2016 and 2017 
was then taken offline um, years later when I went back to search for it. So I haven't recently tried to search for videos like No Respite, but I would venture to guess that they are no longer on YouTube due to these sort of efforts. YouTube um, has moderated far more after pressure. Um, so calls to action led to moderation such as GIFCT and much less extremist content has uh, you know, been available. Part of that has been done through human moderation um, and part of it has been done through machine-based detection that has created ethical AI systems. Now, I wanna offer some conclusions in the last minutes I have to try to present an avenue to engage discourse in platform accountability, a subject that I'm very passionate about and that much of my work um, works on, particularly in the spaces of misinformation and disinformation. And one of the conclusions I've come to is that the best in-class platform accountability groups at social media platforms are being disbanded. Um, very recently, there's a link here I provided that Elon Musk fired Twitter's ethical AI team in one fell swoop. The argument I wanna make here in platform accountability studies is often we cannot leave moderation to the tech platforms. It has to be something that engages multiple stakeholders from, uh, from US government to international government to academics to journalists and many others. Furthermore, we have on the other side some conclusions that I wanted to put out to spur discourse. And our thinking here is making platforms accountable or these calls for action may also lead to some unintended or unforeseen things. That's that some platforms may engage in more black boxing. They move, may move from being public to more private and more products may be packaged as being end-to-end -end encrypted, which sounds good, but they become completely opaque and inaccessible when they're made end-to-end -end encrypted. So some last takeaways here, pressure on platforms can bring change. Another argument I wanna put forward is relatively small change can eliminate many threats, that there are the possibilities, even with black boxing, a lack of transparency, inadequate access to APIs, that there's still ways to creatively reverse engineer and collect data and create good platform accountability methods. And a really strong argument I wanna to make to the community um, out there and those who are watching is that platform accountability really should be longitudinal. That oftentimes we have taken a snapshot. What I've tried to make a case in today's talk as well as my published work is that if we include historical data, but also look at accountability over time, we can notice trends and that can help inform future accountability efforts and to avoid things in the future rather than just having to play catch up. I also wanna do a special thanks to my uh, doctoral uh, GRA Cami Vinton and River Terrell who helped me with these slides. Thank you so much for allowing me to present um, today. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. Thank you very much for the presentation. We're going to hold questions until um, after all the speakers speak. And our next speaker is Dr. Jonathan Zittrin, who is a director and faculty chair of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University in Boston. Dr. Zittrin. Thanks so much. And uh, hello, uh, everyone. Uh, both uh, the attendees and my co-panelists today. It's actually great to see such a longitudinal lineup, and I'm just sorry we're not in person to uh, have snacks and conspire uh, in the hallway in between sessions. Um, if I step back for a moment uh, in thinking about this topic, I feel like my frame is that all of us, but especially our kids, have been guinea pigs in a kind of two or three decade experiment called the internet with no controls, no supervision, certainly no institutional review board. It's kind of funny to think that, you know, whether it's Philip Zimbardo's Stanford prison experiment or Milgram's obedience to authority experiment, the kind of thing that has people um, in academia say, this is why we can't have nice things and actually need to be so careful about anything we do academically. Those strictures only apply, uh, ironically, 
if you are uh, under the common rule, as it's called, um, pursuing the general um, acquisition of knowledge and then planning to share it in a journal. If you're simply pursuing profit and building something, none of those strictures apply. And I think this is an environment that really from the start of its mainstreaming at the turn of our century and millennium, um, had as its goal a kind of privatization, which is to say, having the advances and the efforts possibly come from some public or academic corners, but also being open to the commercial sector. And it's probably no surprise that for a very long time, .com has been sort of the gilded domain name rather than .edu or .org or .gov. And that privatization is reflected in exactly what Professor Murthy was just talking about, that if you want to understand the dynamics of the space, much less if you want to have accountability, if you see something wrong in the space, you're going to have to gather data, but that data is typically in private hands. I think we had a kind of uh, coyote running over the cliff and thinking everything is fine before falling moment, because in the earliest days of the mainstreaming of the internet, people understandably thought that the World Wide Web was the internet and the World Wide Web was crawlable and scrapable. So that even if it were private, privately run websites that were where people were visiting and what was affecting them, academics could be as enterprising as the folks at Google. In fact, Larry and Sergey started as academics, right? They started as grad students, scraping the entire web for the purpose of building an index that would organize it. And that meant you'd have some minimum level of transparency. Fast forward and much of life is not on the web anymore, or if it is, scraping is not alone a way to understand what's going on. Particularly, again, Professor Murthy's example, I think, is just so helpful because when you look at YouTube, uh, a scraping strategy is gonna be tricky. Uh, YouTube might decide to not let your scraper through. In the extreme case, they might choose to go after you under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act or otherwise ban you from the site if your bots are um, deemed a nuisance or if they think that if they've given you API access, you're abusing that access. So really it's a big plus one to Professor Murthy's observations and a kind of thanks to him and all other researchers like him who have been extremely creative about figuring out how to get a sense of what's going on. Um, but gosh, the kind of reverse engineering that he and his graduate students have to do when in many cases, the platforms themselves have the answer. It's not like we're trying to get the ocean to give up its secrets and you can't just say to the ocean, just tell us you know, what's on the ocean floor. These are companies that actually have the answer internally, but of course, uh, absent any other form of suasion or regulation aren't just going to cough it up. So with all of the almost digital swashbuckling that Professor Murthy just described that he was admirably doing, it kind of sets up a little bit of an agenda so that we're collectively driving with headlights on and a dark road, which is to say, to be able to protect the kind of probing and reverse engineering uh, and input output testing that he and others are doing to legally immunize that. Um, and then still not to make it just a cat and a mouse game uh, that says, you know, may your scraper win <laughs> over the anti scraper that they're doing, even if they're not going to come after you legally. And for that, it would have to be well, what forms of disclosure or of access to accredited academics? might be arrangeable that are still respectful of the equities of private companies that a lot of what they do is legitimately trade secret. So uh, I'm among those who've helped run a, a site called lumendatabase.org over the years. It used to be called Chilling Effects, which documents copyright takedowns uh, for um, search engines like Google and uh, other big entities. And that's the kind of thing that when something is taken out of Google, anybody is allowed to look at Lumen database and see what's going on. For some of these other issues, including the example, say, of countering violent extremism, and you have 
possibly unlawful content in many jurisdictions, even maybe possibly in the United States, uh, that is being taken down, it's a little bit hard to say, here's terrorist content, lumendatabase.org. Why don't you browse everything? It's a so-called Streisand effect. You don't want to do that. So one thought would be to have the equivalent of, you know, I don't speak German. You're about to realize that when I mispronounce this, kind of gift shrunk or poison cabinet, which in Germany, both before and after World War II, has been a way for materials deemed especially sensitive or potentially unlawful. I guess the more recent analogy would be the Harry Potter banned or a restricted section of the library at Hogwarts to have some form of accreditation of bona fide researchers on a neutral and non-discriminatory basis. But in accrediting those researchers and validating their purposes, you have an opportunity to actually get them to agree to certain conditions in accessing the archives, which might mean that they, to respect privacy, will release aggregate data, but not individual things that they learn. Um, and that archive could be held by independent third parties, including by the major research or public libraries of the world acting in concert to keep a kind of time capsule for metered access now, possibly 50 or 100 years later, if we're being optimistic about the progress of humanity and its continued existence, our uh, successors and descendants maybe could have wide access the way the Lumen database works. Um, but thinking about ways to credit the equities of the companies while allowing folks like Professor Murthy to spend as much of their time as they please doing analysis of data, rather than just trying to have to keep leveling up against a somewhat stubborn and determined and well-funded foe or frenemy, how to get access to the data seems like a really important thing. And particularly when we're thinking about what's happening with kids and how to be mindful of them and to protect them online, if we don't know how the world is affecting them, what they're doing there, we don't have a hope, I think, of coming up with really powerful policy recommendations. So I think there is a role, a kind of role for meta public policy to facilitate that kind of data access um, and to um, perhaps solicit uh, and arrange for support through our uh, academic funding agencies for this kind of work and analysis. Um, there's a short article that itself is an anchor for a larger paper on the topic with a number of uh, co-authors uh, that I've just put into the chat room, as it were, for everybody. So um, feel free to take a look at that if you find yourself intrigued and curious. And I want to raise one more point, um, which is, it's all well and good to study in order to see how well the stated um, objectives of a platform that says, yes, yes, we too want to have certain strictures on what happens on our platform, how well they're doing that. That is actually good to know and to understand, are there questions we should be asking that we haven't? What are the problems we haven't even anticipated yet? It's all well and good to do that too. But in addition, I think it's worth really reflecting on the question of what sorts of responsibilities platforms and other online uh, producers of information or services that kids are accessing, what special duties they might owe to kids to look out for their interests when part of the definition of being a kid is that you are not in a position maybe to wisely look after your own and your parents aren't in a position to be on your shoulder like a hawk every moment you're online, particularly in the era of smartphones. With Jack Balkan, um, I've uh, been working on a theory of so-called information fiduciaries. And the basic idea of fiduciary is a kind of $10 law professor word or lawyer word. But the basic idea is that there are relationships in society, including professional relationships, commercial ones, where there is such an asymmetry of power and information a patient comes in afraid and worried and confused with a particular condition, and they trust a physician to help lead them through the thicket and recommend a treatment. Or a client turns up to the lawyer, hopefully not with a smoking gun in hand, but with some other problem that they are encountering, 
and they're extremely vulnerable and they are relying on the hard won years acquired trust and expertise and good counsel of those professionals to help them through it. In the cases of doctors and lawyers, we have heightened duties. They are not just business people interacting with folks. They are professionals that owe certain duties to the world at large and to their patients and to their clients to look after their interests and to favor their interests when those interests might conflict with those of the professional. So a doctor shouldn't be recommending a treatment to you simply because they get a finder's fee from a uh, pharmaceutical company for having done so. A lawyer owes you their um, best help and loyalty, even if it might cost them or make them forego some kind of opportunity. There is no, at the moment, parallel responsibility of the platforms to their users, even though I think it is fair to say that the asymmetry of power and of vulnerability especially with children, may be far stronger than that of somebody doing their annual checkup with their primary care physician. That when you have somebody blowing through a few uh, uh, consent boxes, if any, or trying to get rid of the um, cookies acceptance screen that, thanks to our colleagues at the European Union, appears momentarily when you visit a website. Uh, and then from that moment onward, their movements are tracked often from site to site and um, across uh, the web and through their applications. And that data is collected, including location data or seemingly innocuous behavioral data that through the magic of recent machine learning can be used to make particularly incisive insights about folks to in turn be able to do especially persuasive or timely advertising, not just for a bag of potato chips, but for things that can from the point of view of kids especially, get them into trouble um, and uh, uh, into further um, isolation. All of this suggests that we are overdue for a kind of fiduciary approach by the platforms and to together work to see what would it mean if those platforms had a duty of the sort that doctors, lawyers, and depending on your financial advisor, some financial advisors have to their clients. Um, that would be, I think, a wonderful exercise to recommend and to try to bring about uh, in the world. And honestly, I think here, solicitude towards kids, uh, towards um, young children, to adolescents, to teenagers, is just, honestly, it should be the thin edge of the wedge for the rest of us. It shouldn't be a kind of um, strange obsession with choice. Well, as long as you clicked a button, you agreed and we want to vindicate your choice to do something. If the choice is, would you like to be exploited, yes or no, by the time you're presented with that dialogue box as one of hundreds over the course of a day, something is already terribly wrong with this ecosystem. And I do think that the case of kids um, brings this into relief and into focus and calls for um, intervention and possibly helps uh, create a constituency, including a political constituency, to advocate for saying that if we can do it for kids, maybe we can do it for everyone else uh, as well. So um, I think that's a nice kind of bookend towards the kind of uh, transparency um, that we could practically provide for with a form of gift shrink for the decisions and activities of companies as they interact with us day in and day out. I, uh, because I'm unfortunately uh, attending and participating in another conference here in person, uh, I understand that by arrangement with the uh, folks doing this, I should end a little early as I have and possibly be able to take up a question or two uh, before I have to go. But thank, thank you all again for this opportunity. That's that's right. We'll open it up for questions for you now. We appreciate you making the time. I, I was a little bit... Uh... I'm uh, terrified by your metaphor of us all being in one large experiment. Although uh, I, uh, I I thought the point was um, was uh, was very was very well made. Um, um, can I ask for? Um, I'll lead off with one question, and I'll, and I'll invite the other panel members to um, turn on cameras and ask uh, questions as they as they wish to. Um, um, you, um, I, I thought you 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 were very elegant in um, articulating some of the challenges that we're going through. Um, um, but uh, I thought you fell short of proposing solutions. 
Um, um, so, so I'm just wondering if I could if I can challenge you on uh, on that, and if you were to say, um, you know, top one, top two, top three um, uh, things that you think are uh, could be feasible. You know, I'm, I'm trying to dwell in in the world of the possible um, uh, solutions to deal with some of the challenges that I think you so eloquently raised. I would appreciate that. Yeah, happy to do that. And on the um, terrifying front, for which I say my work is done. Uh, if only it were just a metaphor, I actually think it is close to being literally an experiment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you look at the kinds of tools of academia that are brought to bear in order to optimize uh, for engagement and profit, uh, it is indeed an experiment and we are indeed the subjects of same without any of the protections uh, correspondingly. On the solutions front, uh, on transparency, there are a number of solutions floating around, some of which have found their way into legislative proposals that include forms of forced disclosure by the companies of particular algorithms they use, ways to regularize that into the equivalent of nutrition labels, for which especially in our era of machine learning to be able to know the provenance of data sets that have been used to train a model. Um, what's the data that went in? For what purpose was it used? Because so often a lot of the bonks and machine learning come when something developed for one purpose gets casually repurposed for another. Um, a reduction or uh, of liability or correspondingly an increase in immunities for academic researchers and others in good faith that are scraping or otherwise interrogating and reverse engineering sites so that they're not going to face intellectual property claims, trespass to chattel claims, computer fraud and abuse act claims. Being able to vindicate the interests of academic research is something that isn't just something researchers do because somehow they're paid to do it but something done in the interest of society at large and is such a vital piece of the accountability and corrective that we expect of free markets that are as powerful as these that need to operate in the public interest. All of those I would sort of invoke um, as a kind of solution. And along with it, this idea of a gift shrunk. And on that point, I think the library with which I'm associated, I'm the director of the Harvard Law School Library, would welcome an opportunity along with any other libraries that want to kind of fly in formation to take on the serious responsibility of hosting sensitive data that companies have reason not to want to part with or that should it escape could implicate the privacy of their users or sensitive um, content that, that generally no one should see. To be able to navigate all that, I think asking libraries to play an active role is one of my main solutions that is spelled out uh, in that, uh, I think it's a Slate article in like four page format. The linked article with my co-authors is about um, 30 pages uh, explaining the pros, the cons, the drawbacks, and kind of sketching a pilot for how that might work. On the fiduciary front, I think it's borrowing as much as possible from the metaphors of the learned professions, understanding that how it would work for various information platforms is by no means obvious. We think we know and we inculcate it in the respective schools for doctors and lawyers and the professional societies, what their special duties are, what money they have to leave on the table because of these heightened responsibilities. It is to be sure a lot less clear exactly what Facebook needs to start doing differently if they're going to become information fiduciaries, for example. The only example I've offered publicly that seems a clear cut one to me is they shouldn't be using their role as Facebook to try to change the outcome of an election. An article I wrote in 2014, not exactly anticipating uh, that it would end up being a little on the nose. So those are some of the solutions yeah. that I think about. Thank you, it's helpful. I think we have time for one or two questions. Other members of the committee. Sharon, go ahead. Um, thank you so much. I, I think maybe what I'm going to ask is following up what, on what Sandra was asking, what the things that you have listed, those are sort of menu of, of options. I'm just curious if you can um, tell us which ones you think are the most important uh, to address. And I guess, relatedly, you talked about sort of data access, and I think um, that's sort of getting data that's already created is one, but I'm curious how you're thinking about uh, the, the role of being able to do experiments on these platforms, um, as opposed to just sort of basically uh, uh, passively uh, collecting data, if, if you think that that's 
uh, part of it, uh, uh, part of the solution. Uh, yeah, know. what a terrific question. Um, so for the first part of it, I do think the priority should probably be in as maybe harsh as it will sound to the ears of libertarians, things about compelled disclosure rather than just about permissive access. And it's a little tricky because this isn't regularized enough that we know exactly what should be disclosed. It might be highly specific to the service or platform offered. And it might be something that would come into play only after a certain level of usage or success or money flow so that you're not having everybody cooking up something on the internet out of a garage, immediately having these kinds of obligations. But once you're as big as Meta, you know, cry me a river if you have to hire a couple compliance compliance lawyers to sort it out. And often there are disclosure or, uh, uh, elements that come with mergers or competition settlements, FTC settlements that these companies are already contending with. So without waiting for them to screw up enough that the FTC is going to go after them and forge a settlement, it should just be a cost of doing business from the start if your business is large enough. But the second part of your question is really intriguing, which is it's all well and good just to passively do, as we might say, observational studies, but gosh, what you could learn from actually taking the kind of A-B testing that Facebook or one of its advertisers does on a Tuesday morning to figure out exactly what kind of ad gets the most clicks and be able to do that the way that, dare I say, the um, uh, PNAS study uh, the publication uh, proceedings of the National Academies did with the emotional, terribly titled Emotional Contagion Experiment, which was a joint effort of Facebook and some researchers at uh, Cornell and other places that they thought they were actually contributing to the public knowledge. And it was that that got them in trouble. And I, I confess at the time, I was much less critical of that experiment, given what we know and can discern the companies are doing day in and day out this was at least for the public interest. And I think being able to kind of tiptoe back into those waters again, even rewind the clock and say, instead of saying you should never have done the experiment, what would it mean to have done it right? Uh, and what could others of that look like? What a great area uh, to get into and to provide structure for. Thank you. Take like one last quick question, Christopher. Jonathan, always a pleasure. Um, Quick, you raised some interesting possibilities about the roles of libraries and other ways you might solve them. Have you had the opportunity to, to, have, dis, to have discussions with social media companies or other people who might be having to do that about exploring their interest in doing something along those lines? Yes, I have. And in doing so, I have found, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly in retrospect, and by the way, hello, Christopher, it's great to see you. Um, that the companies are in not monolithic, that possibly at times by design, they have, as Google once had, um, uh, what was it called? The Data, uh, uh, Data Portability League or something. Uh, they had a unit within Google that was charged with representing the role of data sharing. Uh, data Liberation Front, I think it was called. And they, of course, charged with that role are going to play it. And then it's up to the rest of the company to play the more typical role and say, but I don't know that we want to share anything that might let people leave Google more easily. And by analogy, I think within the companies, there are folks, including ones who work on the content moderation teams, who are would love the world to know more about the tough decisions they face, don't feel like their decisions necessarily are always the right one because they're so hard and actually would welcome a little bit more attention and you know, assistance in doing it. There are others, uh, probably more in the communications realm of the companies, that would naturally say, anything you give can and will be exploited and used against you, a kind of private self-Miranda warning. And there have been some instances, and I, I bet a number of our colleagues here have been part of or followed along with, for example, the Social Science One efforts with Facebook, where a lot of effort was put in by a number of charitable foundations to support researchers, a number of researchers and the Social Science One uh, folks, and Facebook to figure out how to share data in a sufficiently sanitized way that it doesn't implicate privacy of users so that worthy experiments could be done. That was, I think, an effort that 
everybody, including the company, tried at. And by nearly all accounts, it didn't work out so well. It was a lot of work for very little. Um, is there an appetite for that now? There needs to be a little recovery from stuff like that. There needs to be a sense that um, uh, anything they say won't be used against them. On the other hand, I think the um, kind of wolf nipping at the heels of potential regulation and breakup of big tech, the fact that it's one of the few bipartisan applause lines in a recent State of the Union might provide some incentive for the companies to say, all right, all right, let's do some stuff that we can point to that will show we really are understanding the outsized role our activities and what we offer plays in society. We understand that we're not just selling iron or you know, uh, uh, individual commodities, that what we're doing shapes speech, it shapes the development of children. Uh, and the fact that some of these companies are still run by their founders in ways that they can fire their board and their board can't fire them, if say in the case of Twitter, they even have a board, which now they don't, um, to be able to prevail on just one person who runs the whole show and say, come on, you know, how do you wanna be remembered a hundred years from now? It is a different ball game and possibly more of an all or nothing one than trying to work within the more cautious naturally apparatus of the board of a publicly held company that's just gonna be trying not to have a scandal next week. Thank you, Dr. Zitrin. Thank you for joining us, particularly in the middle of another conference. It was super interesting. I really appreciate you being with us. A pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you. We're going to move on to uh, Dr. Tihana Milosevic, a research fellow in the Anti-Bullying Center and uh, ADAP SFI in Dublin City University. Dr. Milosevic. Thank you. Um, so can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, well, just to say thank you so much for inviting me. I hope this will be helpful. I thought that this was a really good uh, segue to what I'll be talking about. Uh, which is cyberbullying and children and how effective the company's moderation really is at protecting children from cyberbullying. So I'm talking on behalf of my entire team at uh, the DC Anti-Bullying Center and ADAPT SFI. Um, so social media platforms efforts uh, at addressing cyberbullying among children. Can you see the, I'm just gonna, uh, yeah, the-, the uh, Yes, we can see it, we can see the, it. Yeah, good. So first of all, to define the problem. So um, uh, cyberbullying can be considered as a repeated harm inflicted uh, through the use of digital media. Um, and uh, there is a lack of consensus in the academic sector about really the definitions, but it, it, it can be considered as a digital iteration of peer-based aggression. And it is a public health concern in the United States and, and really um, elsewhere as well. Um, and some of the key characteristics that really differentiated from more broad types of online harm is really the intention to harm has to be proven, uh, the repetitive nature of the problem. So typically it happens over time with, or there is a, um, a larger uh, a set of incidents, uh, or it could be one comment as well that is seen by more people in the online context. So the audience is larger and that could count as repetition. And there is typically also the power imbalance between the target and the perpetrator and the perpetrators. So we're talking about a little bit more specific type of uh, type of online harm that is a really significant problem for, for children. So in the United States, for instance, according to uh, recent data from 2021 uh, from the Cyberbullying Research Center, there has been a 40% increase uh, in, in the number of cases reported by children 13 to 17 since the start of the pandemic. Um, and 23% uh, of children were say they were targeted in the previous month. Uh, in Europe, according to the EU Kids Online data, which is uh, the largest research network studying children and digital media in Europe, for internet using nine to 16 year olds, 11% um, of them uh, reported that it happened to them a few times in the past year. Now I have to say that stats vary from, from study to study. Uh, part of that is uh, uh, re relates to really how cyberbullying is defined and operationalized in different studies, but it is a significant problem. Um, and so what have actually uh, companies done to, to moderate cyberbullying on social media? Well, um, as, uh, uh, as you can imagine, uh, uh, cyberbullying is against the company's terms of service, community guidelines, or standards. Um, what happens is that companies often uh, use the term inter interchangeably with harassment, even though, as I said earlier, it's not exactly the same. Um, typically, the more established or, um, if we can put it, mature the company is, so if it's been around in the market for a longer period of time, it has more resources, typically it has a safety center where more information is provided, 
uh, it gives more information about how it, what it considers to be cyberbullying. It tends to give more uh, uh, examples, for instance, of what specific behaviors it would classify as cyberbullying on its platform. Um, however, there has been really a hesitance talking about transparency on behalf of companies to, re to reveal internal moderation documents. So really exact guidelines that they give to their moderation teams uh, about how they regulate cyberbullying. And the reason that they put forth for sort of not uh, giving uh, these detailed explanations is usually that they don't want to actually tell those who want to game the system how to do it. Nonetheless, as you probably have seen in the past few years, there have been many leaks uh, among them, for instance, this one from The Guardian from a few years ago, uh, where these operational guidelines have been leaked, uh, and it sh really showed that uh, the company actually um, allowed uh, for really bullying to slip through the cracks um, in various ways, and of course, the Francis Haugen's revelations, um, and, and etc. So there have been, uh, uh, there have been leaks. Um, uh, but uh, so uh, companies have really um, uh, uh, not provided adequate protections in the past, and I uh, explained some of that in the book I wrote recently, uh, Protecting Children Online. Um, now, how do companies actually, of course, how do they enforce uh, this rule that cyberbullying is, uh, is not permitted? So you've all seen reporting options on social media, uh, where typically we call this reactive moderation. So a child can report and that, that that goes to the moderation system where ideally a human looks into it because cyberbullying is, as I'll explain later, very often context dependent. Um, so it's, it's not that easy to really uh, very often detect it just by uh, automated AI based means. Um, and uh, typically, so in the moderation queue, it's uh, the either the in-house in or outsourced moderators uh, working with AI in some way. Um, there's also the various blocking options, which actually uh, um, really allow someone to uh, get some distance from the, the person who is perpetrating cyberbullying by not allowing them to be contacted again. Um, and um, so just blocking them from uh, having access to the target. Now, children uh, uh, very often, and this is a really important part of what I'm doing is because companies don't really often reveal whether they involve children in the evaluation process of their tools and how they do that. What we have tried to do on the research side independently is to actually do research with children, qualitative and quantitative, asking them uh, about their feedback on the effectiveness of, of these tools on various platforms that are popular with them. So very often what children actually report to us is that they're hesitant to block because uh, uh, it's quite clear to the other person that they have been blocked. And because cyberbullying tends to happen in the offline context. So remember going back to peer relationships. So it could be school, it could be just regular offline peer context. Uh, very often the online part when you block someone can exacerbate uh, and the, the perpetrator can retaliate. So they're hesitant to do that. But Companies have come up with different solutions, which um, allowed them, for instance, Instagram has muting and restricting, which uh, really is a, a more polite way of blocking. When you mute someone, you don't get to see uh, what they post. When you restrict someone, that person can, for instance, still post on, on your um, whatever profile or send you messages, but you don't get those, you don't see those, and the other person doesn't know. You also have comment filtering, which uh, sort of work on filtering out uh, uh, content that could be cyberbullying. So you just don't get to see it. It just gets automatically filtered out if you if you click it on. So all of these tools that companies have developed really, and this is important, I'll come back to it later, uh, put the onus really on the young user uh, to, to, to sort of protect themselves. So they say, here, we give you these tools, but when you filter something out, when you mute restrict, when you block, uh, unlike with reporting, it, it doesn't involve uh, the company's moderation, but really it's all left to the users so that the platform doesn't get involved. So in a way, part of the process is then not handled, not, the platform is not responsible for it. Um, I have to mention a few earlier efforts that I actually appreciated, and to my best knowledge, uh, they haven't been further developed on these platforms, and I think it might be a shame, such as Facebook social reporting, which was developed uh, in partnership with Yale and Berkeley um, a few years ago now, where uh, they worked with uh, neuroscience researchers to really develop pre-made messages, which a child that is targeted can send to the perpetrator to politely ask them to take it down. And the messages have been optimized to really trigger empathy within the perpetrator and to increase the likelihood of taking that content down. So that was for a while experimented on Facebook. Also, there were years back escalation uh, pilots in, in Maryland with uh, between Facebook and Maryland, 
uh, where they uh, attorney general's office, where they uh, really try to sort of have a, 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 a contact point uh, in each school um, where that uh, like a staff, a professional staff member who would have a direct channel of communication with the company. So for instance, if the company was not able to take uh, down a case um, uh, of bullying in that school of a child uh, because they couldn't establish that it was a violation of the terms of service, um, the school which had more information about the case uh, could, through that privileged contact, say, hey, here's further evidence, and this really is bullying, and there's offline evidence as well that this is happening. Can you please take it down? But this brings us to the core issue of the effectiveness, really, from children's perspective of content removal. So what kind of data do we have on whether this actually works for children? Because if you take content down, and this is what we have been hearing from our research in Norway and Ireland, uh, children find that helpful in the sense that it's a good first start. So it sends the message to the perpetrator and sort of to the broader community of peers that uh, uh, that this is not okay, it should not be repeated, uh, but it's only the beginning because cyberbullying, for instance, can have uh, serious, especially if combined with offline bullying, can have serious negative consequences for the child's self-esteem, for their school performance. Uh, also, it could have, in some cases, long-term impacts, even in adulthood, in the form of depression and anxiety. So there really needs to be a broader stakeholder support. So empowering other children through education as to what to do, empowering the target in terms of what to do when cyberbullying happens, the parents, also the school context. And at the same time, there also has to be this follow-up with the child. Sometimes it's counseling. Um, and what I have been arguing in the book and, and previously for, for, for a while now is that really uh, through legislation, uh, companies should be asked in some way, made actually, uh, to really contribute to that educational effort, so to prevention, um, and also uh, to uh, really follow up in terms of providing financial support for, for, for those kinds of negative effects that cyberbullying can have on children. Um, and I think that the legislation that has really, that is uh, in the works in, in Europe, which I'll give examples of, um, really offers some space to actually do that. So rather than uh, saying to, rather than actually allowing to companies to just say, hey, we'll give a gift to this um, institution to do actually education or research into this as sort of a gift, but rather it should be baked into legislation in some form. So um, as I hinted earlier, there's reactive moderation, uh, and uh, that's when someone reports cyberbullying, and then it goes to moderation queue. But because there are vast volume, there's a the large volume of content, uh, and it's really hard to cover all of that with human moderators, um, and uh, it, uh, companies are more and more relying on artificial intelligence, and they're not actually waiting for someone to report content, but they're proactively, so to speak, crawling or scanning content using AI to actually detect cyberbullying. Um, and uh, we have actually, uh, with I, I'm not a computational scholar, so my colleagues uh, in computing, we've, we've partnered to actually look into how can we evaluate uh, what the companies are doing. So the, the, the models, AI-based models that the companies have develop, developed, how can we actually evaluate their effectiveness at detecting cyberbullying? And so my colleagues have looked into uh, really the um, what is available, uh, what companies have really put forth in terms of what they're doing um, to detect cyberbullying, what AI models they're de developing. And um, they looked into various databases, uh, information from companies, and I also tried interviewing companies about this. So knowing sort of how do you execute this AI-based proactive moderation? Is it that only publicly shared content uh, is screened? What about private messages? What happens when there is encryption? Uh, what about the privacy directive in, in Europe? How do you go about all of that? So I was, I was trying to really figure, figure that out. How does that happen? And I could obtain very few uh, interviews with companies and companies that were really willing to talk to me. And None of those I was actually able to use uh, in my dissemination. Uh, but my, my colleagues have uh, really come to the conclusion when they try to evaluate some of the uh, proprietary tools really that, that companies have developed that really very little can be known about their effectiveness in tackling cyberbullying. Also importantly, uh, these were primarily developed to target hate speech and hate speech is different from cyberbullying. It, it really relates to racial, ethnic and other identity-based targeting, which is not exactly the same as cyberbullying. 
Um, and so uh, they, if, if you, I can share the, uh, the articles are in my uh, references. So uh, if, if you're interested, I can, I can share the, um, uh, the articles that I'm referring to here from the recent Asso uh, Association of Internet Researchers uh, conference. Um, so companies also tell us in their transparency reports, and this is uh, uh, typically the, 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 the more established companies that, that would have those, they tell us, uh, for instance, how much of bullying on their platform they were able to detect proactively, so before it's actually reported. Um, so for instance, this is from Meta saying, what is the proactive rate of bullying and harassment detection? Uh, so this is how much they were able to detect in the past quarter uh, before it was even reported. But again, um, to my best knowledge and from, from our investigation, they don't really tell us, again, how this is specifically done in terms of the questions that I raised earlier. Um, and also importantly, and I, I'll get to this later, they don't tell us to what extent really and whether children have been involved in the design of safety tools and the evaluation of the safety tools. And I think uh, when talking about, we had this debate a few, a few days ago uh, about meaningful, and, and today, of course, it was raised as well, about meaningful transparency. This is something that we, that we really have to ask. So uh, again, over the past few days, you've heard about the efforts in, in, in Europe, and I'll just briefly touch on some of that and how it relates to this. The Digital Services Act in, uh, in the EU. In Ireland, we just have the Online Safety and Media Regulation Bill, which was just recently adopted. So we'll have an online safety commissioner, just like in Australia. And the Australian one uh, was around for a few and, and did really, uh, in my view, great work uh, uh, over the past few years. Um, and uh, so uh, this really is systemic regulation. So it's, it's trying to really look at how the content circulates by regulating by online safety codes and also by establishing really avenues for auditing. Uh, there is also in Ireland and in Australia, the individual complaints mechanism, which just means, for instance, that if um, the platform hasn't taken down something that a user has reported, uh, for instance, several times, they have as sort of the, the last resort, they can go to the commissioner and uh, ask for it to be inspected for eventual content takedown. So all of the sort of principles that, that we've talked about in the, in the past few days, especially with Professor Sonia Livingstone and Katina Michael, um, uh, safety by design, age appropriate design, duty of care in the UK. So, so considering uh, the impact on children um, in the design of all of these tools. So that's in principle, in theory, uh, in these uh, pieces of legislation. Um, also, the, in, in Ireland and in Australia, there is the provision for youth councils. And actually, in Australia, they already have a youth council. So um, an avenue to actually involve children uh, in, in all of these processes. So in theory, uh, in my view, at least, this is a good start. But again, it, it brings us back to the issue of shortcomings of transparency. And in my view, the way I see the, the, the sort of meaningful transparency is really uh, for the sake of auditing. And that for me means evaluating effectiveness of all of these tools from children's perspective. And that means with children and by children. And as you heard pro from Professor Livingstone, it's, it's really not a trivial matter because children have rights as per the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which applies in digital environments. And part of that is that they actually have the right to be consulted on matters that concern them. And how cyberbullying is regulated in these spaces is clearly a, a matter that directly concerns children. So it shouldn't be an afterthought. It shouldn't be something that is a plus for companies. It should be something that is obligatory. And in my view, it shouldn't be, and I, I think that with this legislation, it, it, it won't be just left to the companies to do that, but there will be greater state involvement in this process. And of course, uh, the establishment of the balance of rights, as, as Professor Livingstone was, was explaining, um, that really uh, the, the balance between the right to be protected, which is to be protected from cyberbullying, and also to participate in these spaces, which, which can bring great benefits to them. Now, uh, I'll talk about our research. Actually, it relates really well to what uh, Professor Zittrain and um, Professor Murthy were saying. Um, is, is really, we, we uh, are, so I have to say this uh, uh, openly and before I even start, this was actually, this research was funded by Meta Content Policy Award Grant. It was, uh, and there was discussion a few days ago here about industry funding, and I think it's a much needed public debate. Um, and uh, the company uh, did not get involved in, in terms of they just uh, gave us the funding and they didn't get involved in the design or in the whatever we decided to publish in the end. But we proposed initially to do something completely different, which was actually not possible because uh, uh, Meta couldn't give us access to Instagram that we actually needed. 
uh, to be able to do the, the initial study that we actually proposed and that they agreed that they would fund. So essentially with my colleagues from the School of Computing, we uh, wanted to actually port um, an AI-based tool um, and ideally also receive anonymized data from Instagram so that we're able to actually fine tune this model um, to Instagram data and then to port this model actually on the platform and then evaluate its effectiveness with children. But we were not able to do that because eventually the, the company was not able to uh, supply us really with access, not with the data set. Um, and not with, with access to the platform. So we had to really change uh, uh, our study. And because we realized that there, there we, we couldn't find really much information about whether children are involved in the design of these tools and what their views are on the process of proactive moderation. Um, so what are their views as to how that impacts their privacy? For instance, if private messages are monitored, um, what kinds of uh, what kinds of really uh, opt-ins, uh, opt-outs would they actually like to see? What kinds of implications would there ha would that have on their right to freedom of expression? What if, for instance, the AI model makes mistakes, and if content that is not cyberbullying at all, but it's actually just a funny banter that they're engaging in is detected by mistake. So what are they, their views uh, on all of that? So that's what we wanted to find out. And, and this is what we did in qualitative research. So uh, on top of uh, all of this, um, uh, we uh, so we asked them about what companies are already doing based on what we know from transparency reports, so proactive moderation. But at the same time, we uh, built hypothetical interventions. So. Uh, interventions that don't exist on popular social media platforms, but are based on previous research into social learning and social norm theory, such as we proposed, uh, what if there was uh, a peer supporter uh, that you can add when you sign up on the platform? It's a, like a form of support contact or helper who uh, could be contacted if, for instance, AI detects cyberbullying against you. And if that person is then uh, prompted to assist the target in some way, either by providing them with emotional support, either by reporting the content to the platform, um, or in some other way. That could be a peer, it could be an adult, like a parent or a teacher. We also, there has been significant research into bystander involvement. Uh, bystanders are those who witness cyberbullying, but they may or may not get involved. And if they get involved, they can help the victim and they become then upstanders or they can worse um, uh, uh, actually assist the perpetrator uh, and, in, in, and we really want to discourage that. So there has been a lot of previous research as to how to optimize really technological interfaces to uh, actually uh, uh, really incentivize bystanders to get involved to support the target. So we uh, ask children about their views on involving bystanders when AI detects cyberbullying uh, in different ways, either by asking the perpetrator to take the content down, either by supporting the target. Um, and so we also uh, 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 explored this idea of AI-triggered school involvement that I was telling you that uh, there was this pilot uh, in, in Maryland years ago. Um, and uh, it, it, we proposed what if, uh, for instance, every school had an official account on some of the popular platforms where one could report to when cyberbullying is detected. So uh, we asked children for their views and all of that. And we also had some sanctions for, for perpetrators, such as similar to uh, you might have uh, heard of shadow banning, uh, where um, someone is um, uh, really their, their content is not prioritized anymore and just less visible. But we asked children what their views would be if those who were perpetrators in cyberbullying um, had less engagement on their post for, post for a limited amount of time uh, on any content that they put out. Uh, it would just be underprioritized for a limited amount of time, and this would be completely transparent. So we asked them about their views on that. And we did qualitative research, uh, uh, so with children in Ireland, uh, age uh, 12 to 17. Um, and, just oh, just to, yeah. to, to alert another two to three minutes. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, so this is just, uh, thank you. Um, so um, I just wanted to give you one example of, of cyberbullying. That is, these are uh, um, uh, the, the scenarios that we developed in uh, a design um, um, uh, program called Figma. So we laid out all of those and we show them to children in qualitative research and ask them for feedback. So one actually really example of more subtle, more context dependent cyberbullying is really um, uh, by exclusion. And this is actually Instagram reported that this was a very popular way for teen girls to bully each other. So they would go to an offline event where they would deliberately not invite one girl or, or more girls. And then they would take a photo of themselves from the offline event and then tag the girl who was not invited. 
And so we uh, actually uh, uh, ask children, what if AI would be involved in, in this process by figuring out that more uh, children were tagged than were actually present in the photo? And what if AI was able to scan private messages and detect that actually uh, they were conspiring uh, to uh, not invite the fourth one? And that was used as evidence to establish that this was actually cyberbullying. And what if then um, uh, AI was involved? Would you actually welcome that? So just very briefly, in, in our results, uh, children overall uh, welcomed uh, AI interventions as, as sort of this broad idea, but they raised significant concerns around privacy, especially regarding uh, scanning the, their direct messages, use of facial recognition, which many of them uh, thought were creepy. Some actually thought it was okay if, if it was for great, the greater good of, of, of really detecting cyberbullying. But um, uh, very like a, a lot of children explained that they were not sure if they would actually use this. And as for proactive monitoring of content for the sake of detecting cyberbullying, they wanted to have a clear um, uh, at least opt out if not opt in. Um, and there was a lot of hesitancy around bystander involvement. And I just kind of, in terms of my implications, I want to bring this to um, uh, really uh, uh, one really important, broader uh, uh, sort of uh, social issue. A lot of children were really concerned about reporting cyberbullying to anyone. And one of the key things that we tell them when cyberbullying happens is to make sure that they have evidence and to talk to someone in order to get support. Yet, what we really hear from children in this research is that they're very hesitant to tell anyone. They prefer really to have those tools that companies are offering already, which is just to mute restrict, handle it on their own, which is how really companies defer responsibility for cyberbullying onto young users. Um, and But they actually prefer not to make a big deal out of it because no one wants to be perceived as a target, as a victim. Um, so the social norm of self-reliance, um, uh, it was really strong. And you can read more about this in, in our uh, uh, report. It's publicly available. So asking for help was seen as something that is really for sensitive children, and no one wants to be defined as sensitive. And perhaps most importantly, there was it was really expected that uh, those, if you want to be on social media, you have to grow a bit of a thick skin. Uh, and uh, social media is, and sort of the online world is sort of not really for sensitive children. And I think this is what brings us to the broader issue of to what extent can we expect to have technological solutions? Uh, well, we have to have technological solutions uh, uh, that are effective from children's perspective. At the same time, it's extremely important to understand the broader, really social um, uh, sort of context uh, in, in which these incidents unfold. So thank you. I'm sorry if I went over time. That's fine. Thank you, Dr. Lomas. It was actually super interesting. I look forward to the question and answer session. Thank you. Um, um, we're going to move on to uh, Professor Isabel Gerard, who is a, uh, um, a senior lecturer in digital communication at the Department of Sociological Studies at the University of Sheffield. Professor Gerard. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, just to say it's doctor, not professor. I'm not, <laughs> not quite there yet, uh, but thank you so much. Um, I just want to check that everyone's able to hear me okay before I proceed. We can hear you fine. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay. Is everyone able to see that okay? Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you ever so much. So I just want to begin by saying thank you so much for the kind invitation to present today. Um, and an especially big thanks to Gillian for being flexible in terms of what it was that I presented. Um, I kind of went backwards and forwards in thinking about what I really, really wanted to say. Um, and what I really want to say about content moderation today is in relation to a genre of communication that I feel isn't given sufficient attention um, in kind of academia, in policy circles, in the press, and so on. Um, it's something that we know very little about, and yet anonymous app user bases can rival what I would call the big players in the tech scene um, at the height mm. of their use. And I've been conducting some empirical qualitative research around teens uses of anonymous apps and that's what I'm going to be presenting to you today and um, in particular the element of content moderation how these apps are moderated and how content moderation essentially explains why they often fail and why they are so famously controversial so I'm just going to begin 
um, by giving you a bit of background to me and my research. Um, so my name is Isabel Gerard, um, spelled a little bit peculiar, but it's just pronounced Isabel. Um, and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield. So I'm in a sociology department, but my background is in media and communications, and I am a qualitative researcher. So I was given a grant um, by an organization in the UK called the British Academy. And this grant facilitated some research that I conducted. You'll see that the pandemic is like right bang in the middle of those dates. <laughs> so this was supposed to be a shorter project than it was um, because it, so it was school-based essentially. So I went into several schools to speak to teens about how they feel about anonymous apps. Um, and I'm gonna do some definition work in a moment. So I spoke to 36 teens aged between 13 to 18, four kind of adults in their lives. This was sort of an accidental part of the research, um, but it wound up playing quite an important role um, in terms of the perceptions of the apps from adults and kind of the governance of app controversies that had gone on in some of the schools. And then um, before the interview side of the project, I worked with over 200 teens um, across several workshops where I got them to um, do kind of art and creative projects to express their views on anonymous apps. And I didn't interview all of those teens. Um, and just to say that the findings were from a mixture of gender identities, school types. So in the UK, we have kind of schools that you pay for, schools that you don't, schools that are premised on religion and so on and so forth. Um, and then I also tried to get diversity in terms of students' ethnicity and religion as well. So just to kind of circle back to the very beginning. So what is an anonymous app? So there are so many examples. So there's been um, YOLO, LMK, Telenim, um, Sadaha, there was Ask FM a long time ago. There are so many to name and what's really interesting and what's actually really central to the talk that I'm giving today is this idea that they come and go very, very fast and they're actually really difficult to keep on top of. Um, so anonymous apps essentially let you send messages to other app users anonymously. So effectively, you know who you are sending a message to, but the recipient does not know who has sent it. Um, there are several subgenres of anonymous app, and I'm going to say more about that in a moment. And like I said, they are understudied academically, even though user numbers often rival the big players. And when I go to academic conferences and even in my colleagues teaching, one of the things I notice is that the same names keep coming up when we talk about social media. It's Facebook, it's Twitter, it's Instagram, it's TikTok, it's YouTube, it's Snapchat. And yes, all of those apps are incredibly important. They are incredibly popular and you know central to the lives of many, many children and young people but so are these apps. And you never really hear anonymous app brand names or even just the genre name dropped in the same way in conversations about the impacts of social media on children and young people, particularly in terms of their mental health, particularly in terms of bullying and all of the different kinds of online harms that we can conceive of. And I think to be honest that not talking about them and not studying them and not putting them in the picture and in the conversation with other apps for me I feel like to some extent you know children are being failed and so one of the things that I think is really interesting is that anonymous apps and um, they there's kind of, it's kind of the genre of app um, but then um, in my forthcoming book which is being published by the University of California Press um, I've devised some kind of subgenres. This is a draft. <laughs> it's probably it's going to go through peer review. It's probably going to be changed. But it's just worth noting that anonymous, anonymous apps work differently. So some of them invite you to confess kind of secrets um, to each other or about yourself. Some of them, um, some of the very more controversial ones, um, they, they invite you to give feedback um, or engage in Q&As. And they're often connected to more mainstream apps. So um, like YOLO and LMK were connected to Instagram and Snapchat. Um, 
and you would basically you would say hook YOLO onto Snapchat so you would say okay I'm going to use YOLO to ask people to I don't know rate my attractiveness tell me what they think of me tell me if they think anyone has a crush on me these are all things that teens were asking through YOLO and then you would add that on to your Snapchat so what's very interesting is that a lot of anonymous apps are linked into and out of more mainstream apps um, and that often means that they go a little bit more under the radar. Um, gossip apps as well, Yik Yak is quite a famous um, example of gossip apps and these offer what I would call localized anonymity so essentially you're linked by your affiliation and so you kind of even though you don't know who the poster is you are, you are often aware of who is being posted about um, and so particularly in terms of the previous really fascinating presentation on cyberbullying, it's often apps like Yik Yak where cyberbullying um, takes place because of this kind of localized nature of communication. And then we've got, this is a bit of a vague name, uh, but we've got what I would call social apps. And so these are apps that aim to connect you to complete strangers in a way to kind of expand your social network. And they often work by randomization. Um, another, it's not really an anonymous app, but something like Omegle, um, where you can kind of meet people anonymously, but in a video way, that kind of thing. So that's a bit of an intro to anonymous apps. And what I'm going to do today is talk mainly about the, the aspect of content moderation. So not just how are these apps moderated because they're moderated in much the same way that mainstream apps are so a combination of kind of human and automated moderation that is very very standard for anonymous apps um, but the element of anonymous apps that I want to talk to you about today is how quickly they rise in popularity and how the concerns about content moderation for apps that become very popular very fast are different. These conversations that we need to be having are different to questions we would ask a, a more established social media app slash platform. And I'm sure you can think of examples in your minds. So I'm going to be talking first and foremost about this concept of what I call popularity by surprise um, and telling you about the life cycle of anonymous apps and kind of doing that central framing of this is why we need to be asking different questions about content moderation. And then in the remaining part of the presentation, I'm going to be telling you very briefly why the apps are popular. You can probably imagine why they're popular. Um, but then in what I think is the, you know, this kind of the central part of the talk, really, I want to talk to you about why they fail. Because there are complex reasons why they fail and they are complex and interrelated reasons. But my crucial argument here is that Anonymous apps are often thought to fail because they are assumed to attract bullying behaviours and various online harms, when actually, yes, they sometimes do, not always, but they do. One of the reasons they fail is because of failures in content moderation, precisely because they become so popular so fast. Um, so it's a very shorthand version of the argument that I'm going to now expand on in more depth in my remaining time. So this concept of popularity by surprise, this is something that I wrote about in a paper that I'll um, share at the end of the presentation and that I also wrote about in this Wired piece. Um, so anonymous apps tend to become unexpectedly popular and that makes it really tough to keep on top of the most popular ones. One of the things I really enjoy doing, um, probably because this is my research area, <laughs> is reading interviews with um, anonymous app founders whose apps failed and reading their kind of like post-mortem interviews and and their blog posts that they write and things like that because the, a really common thread through all of them is that people say we just couldn't control it um, and there was a really really powerfully written blog post by the founder of um, an app called Secret um, his name is David Baitow um, I think I pronounced that right and he he, he talks about, you know, how anonymity was just such a double-edged sword. And he, he talks about how he just could not control this app. He just lost control of this app. Um, he lost control of the ability to successfully moderate it and to keep it safe. Um, and I believe that he shut the app down um, himself. And so what happens is that anonymous apps are often kind of victims of their own success. 
And so they rise and fall in popularity very, very sharply. And what often happens, they're often considered to fail, not because they have literally failed as in that they have stopped attracting users, but because they are removed from app stores because they're considered to be too dangerous. Um, and so they kind of, they literally can go from having a thousand users to three million users in the space of, you know, a few weeks. And that was something that happened to an app called Saraha um, that I'll talk to you about in a moment. But really ironically, and something I found in my research, this trend is what makes them so appealing to teens is that they know that these apps are going to be really, really short lived and they want to get on the bandwagon and they want to see what the hype is about before they die. And they're so aware that these apps die and they're so aware. I remember, I remember one of my research participants saying they're so stereotyped to be apps that you behave badly on and then they die that that's almost what they've become now. It's almost become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I found that to be very interesting, that it's um, it's actually part of what makes them so attractive, which then makes kind of your job and my job all that more difficult in a sense. So I'm just gonna to touch on this briefly because I do think it's quite self-explanatory. So why are anonymous apps so popular? So they enable identity exploration, especially for teens. Um, I don't think I need to tell the people in this room and in this audience um, that teens like to explore their identity. They have questions about themselves, their bodies, their lives, um, and they want to ask those questions and often don't feel comfortable asking those questions to um, adults in their lives, teachers, peers, and so on. And so there's lots of great research that's come out of um, kind of people in sort of education studies fields where they've talked about the different ages um, and as they correspond to the people you want to disclose secrets to. So at what age are you likely to stop confiding in a parent and start confiding in a friend, for example? It's, and it's really, it's a really interesting body of work. Um, but the point is that teens don't always have the right person in that moment in their life to ask a question to. And relatedly, they are mechanisms to evade stigma. So there are still things that rightly or wrongly get stigmatized in society. And often if a teen is experiencing one of them or even just has questions, anonymous apps enable, again, teens to just ask a question and get information and knowledge and share experiences with people without the fear of kind of personal repercussions. Finally, they aren't as public facing as other social platforms. Something I found in my research is this kind of, I wouldn't go so far as to call it a disdain, but a, a distancing from the concept of creating a profile in the way that we would, you know, I kind of, I would say that I grew up on MySpace um, and Bebo. And the whole point of that was that you built a profile and your profile reflected your identity. And I would say that the teens in my research were moving away from profile building, in part actually because of, controversies around data mining and data collection and um, so something like Cambridge Analytica came up a few times um, so yeah they are three of many reasons why the apps are so popular but crucially what I want to talk to you about today is why the apps fail so first and foremost they do indeed attract bullying behaviors um, I would be lying if I said they did not um, I went into this research with an open mind. I did not want to go in assuming that the apps were quote unquote bad for teens. Um, I was quite keen to kind of get some empirical backing to claims that are often made in the media about how awful anonymous apps and then by proxy anonymity is. Um, and I went in with you know the request that teens just give me their opinions even if they've never used the apps themselves. So I just wanted opinions and thoughts. Um, and my job wasn't to tell them what to think. Um, but I did find examples of bullying. I found examples of gossip and rumor spreading, appearance-based insults, especially for the female participants and um, so on. But the central reason that they fail is that they just become too popular way too quickly which means that all of the behaviors that I've just talked about are not governed and controlled and moderated successfully enough 
in that very short time frame of popularity to make the apps deemed to be safe. Um, and a very common kind of downfall, well, origin and downfall story of the apps is that an app is invented, it gets very, very popular. And I would also, I would love to know the reasons why I would love to do a study on that. You know, it gets very popular very, very quickly. Um, something happens, either a child will, for example, take their own life or will try to take their own life or something will happen in relation to something bad that occurred on the app, like bullying. It will get publicized um, and then public pressure will sort of force an app to, to be taken down. In some instances, like I mentioned earlier, um, app founders will themselves take apps down. Um, and I don't have time to go into them, but Fling, this story on um, Fling, and then the one on the other slide, Sadaha, um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, have a look at, you know, if you're interested in this particular topic and want to learn more, their sort of origin and downfall stories are very, very typical of, of what it is that I'm talking about today. And what's very interesting is that, you know, in the UK context, we're having a heck of a lot of conversation about anonymity. And I would say that, um, I mean, it's a, how we call it a very, very contentious issue. Um, we have sort of the online safety bill, as was mentioned in the previous presentation. And I would say that the social mood towards anonymity in a UK context in particular um, is quite negative. But what's really interesting about anonymous apps is that it's not anonymity itself that makes the apps unsafe. Instead, it is the failures of, of content moderation. So apps like Fling and Saraha do not collapse because they're unpopular. They collapse because they are too popular and their founders are unprepared for the necessary scale of content moderation. So content moderation on, on anonymous apps is usually done through the typical combination of using AI and also using human moderators as well. Each app company will have a, you know, will kind of configure that differently, um, but that is the very, very typical model. Um, but what happens is the AI can't catch everything. We know that that's been either said or inferred in all of the presentations um, from this afternoon but also humans cannot physically cope with the workload. Um, and you imagine an app that just suddenly, literally has, instead of 3,000 messages being sent through it, as was Sarahar's founder's goal, actually, um, he's a, he just wanted 3,000 messages to be sent on the platform. Within a couple of weeks, that became 3 million. And the AI, the AI systems combined with the human workforce that they had physically, physically could not handle it. They could not. The AI wasn't picking everything up and there weren't enough humans. Um, you know, startup companies often assume that they're not going to make money at all, let alone early on. And so what happens is that workforces are not scaled up fast enough to cover that workload. And so what you've literally got is, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands, I honestly don't have the numbers here, um, but you have a heck of a lot of incredibly harmful posts that circulate on these apps and you physically don't have anyone there to deal with them. And so what I'm trying to say is that when we talk about content moderation and we ask questions about content moderation, I do believe we need to be asking different questions about content moderation when we talk about anonymous apps and, and apps that become what I would call popular by surprise. So they become very popular within a very short space of time in a way that their founders hadn't imagined or prepared for. Oh, sorry, and so this is my final... Oh, I'm three... so sorry. Sorry, uh, two minutes. Yeah, this is my final slide. Thank you Perfect. so much. Um, so my final slide, I just kind of have three sort of provocations for us um, to move forward with the conversation. So I would argue that anonymous apps need to be included in any debates about online harms and kind of children's safety alongside the big players. And I do think it's quite dangerous that we don't know enough about the apps roles in children's lives despite their tremendous, tremendous popularity. Anonymous apps remind us that content moderation includes a very profound trade-off between automated and human moderation. We saw that in, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic, we see it across all the big players. 
it is an ongoing, very, very difficult conversation, um, but it's one that we can see here too. And finally, anonymous apps remind us that social apps that become rapidly popular have different responsibilities than established players in the tech scene. Something that the online safety bill in the UK did um, was it started to propose kind of tiers um, like it was going to put platforms into different tiers, tier one and tier two, partly based on user numbers and or size um, of the organization and of the app. Um, and it it brought up a lot of questions around how you would categorize something that literally in a three week period went from zero to hero. Um, but, but it was an interesting start of kind of peeling back the layers of not all platforms are the same. And like I said, this research has been published here in this internet policy review piece. I'm happy to share a link if anyone would like it. Um, it also informed this case study that I wrote with the Five Routes Foundation in the UK that Sonia Livingston um, is involved with as well. And then just to finally say thank you so much for a very fast whistle stop tour of anonymous apps. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present today and I look forward to everyone's comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gerard. That was terrific. And uh, the last speaker of this panel is Mr. Tom Romanoff. Um, uh, Tom is director of the Technology Project at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Mr. Romanoff, welcome. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be with you and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Romanoff, as you mentioned, and I'm the director of the Technology Project at BPC, our Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, we're a think tank in Washington, DC. And we hope to foster bipartisan solutions uh, to difficult questions and produce uh, enduring policy resolutions. Uh, my team specifically looks at translating technology issues for policy considerations and research different stakeholder positions. So we sit in between Congress, the executive branch, civil society, industry, um, and trade organizations to try to come up with policy recommendations. There's often a technical and communications gap on the Hill that we seek to fill. And in the content moderation space, we're both an educator to policymakers and an advocate for sensible reforms to Section 230 and online platform moderation. We hope to engage this group uh, and other academics and diverse stakeholder groups to understand better this landscape. Uh, the more information we have, the better we can convey it. And today I'll be presenting what our current understanding of the congressional and legal landscape is in the US uh, Congress on Section 230 and content moderation. So it's a level set. If you're not aware, I'm sure this group is. Section 230 is uh, the section of the Title 47 of the United States Code, which was enacted as part of the United States Communications Decency Act and generally provides immunity for websites, uh, platforms concerning third party uh, content. Uh, when it was crafted, Senator Ron Wyden and Representative Chris Cox, uh, a Republican and a Democrat, they crafted Section 230 so website owners could moderate sites without worrying about legal liability. Uh, since its enactment, uh, um, the online system ecosystem has been a major economic growth and communications driver. However, uh, and we'll go over today, some of the calls to reform Section 230, and they've been increasing over the last few years as uh, uh, more and more of our lives um, and work evolve online. Very quickly, I wanna talk a little bit about the First Amendment and how it plays into this. Uh, private companies can create rules to restrict speech if they so choose. Uh, this is why the first, uh, this is why Facebook and Twitter have been able to ban hate speech, for example. And even though it's legally permitted in the United States, um, they can take actions. YouTube took steps to limit misinformation about aspects of the 2020 election. Apple and Google temporarily removed Parler from its app store. These are all examples of First Amendment in practice. Um, these moderation rules are all, all protected, uh, but they tend to cloud the Section 230 and content moderation debate. So let's look at Section 230 reforms. And we can start with um, probably the most recent um, kind of jump in attention, and that's when President Trump turned his attention to it. In the last two years of his administration, he broadly backed Republican efforts to change the law in Congress. Uh, this was in response to perceived uh, bias against conservative thought. Um, and in April 2018, a different tack was used where Trump signed into law the Allow States and Victims of, to Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. Um, was created to create a new exemption around Section 230, stating that Section 230 doesn't apply to civil or criminal charges of sex trafficking 
or to the conduct that promotes or facilitates prostitution. Uh, this rule applies retroactively to sites and is one reason why um, we can already see the impact of it in that uh, websites such as Craigslist have taken down their uh, uh, personal ad section because sex workers used it to advertise. And rather than moderate that section, they chose to remove that feature completely. Um, continuing under what President Trump did, uh, his attorney general Barr also created extensive recommendations for reforming Section 230, which to this day are having an impact. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, looking at President Biden's position, um, he's also proposed revoking Section 230, saying it should be revoked because it's not merely uh, he's talking about uh, Meta or Facebook at the time. It's not merely an internet company. It's um, a perpetuating falsehoods uh, that they know to be so false. And so very interesting, you see uh, in the last two uh, presidencies, uh, a call to reform or repeal Section 230, which has translated into uh, congressional reform efforts. We've tracked over 56 different bills uh, by Republicans, Democrats, and bipartisan coalitions. And they range from completely repealing Section 230 or taking away the liability protections to carving out further exemptions, such as what was stated before, adding transparency requirements and including specific data in the scope of uh, regulations. Um, many of these reforms generally fall into two categories. One is this carve out approach that uh, removes protections of certain content categories. Um, and the other is a bargaining chip system that ties liability to protection uh, to meet certain standards. An example of this is the recent Earn It Act, which was bipartisan, uh, which would make sites demonstrate that they're fighting uh, child sex abuse. Now, looking at it from a party specific uh, perspective, um, you know, we'll look at Democrats first who have largely been concerned with getting platforms to remove content because of the harms associated with speech, terrorism, mis and disinformation harassment. Uh, to facilitate this, they've helped introduce seven, several bipartisan proposals to erode Section 230. Uh, for example, Senator Richard Blumenthal, which was the sponsor of uh, Earn It Act, is a frequent critic of Section 230 protections. Uh, Senator Brian Schultz, who has uh, proposed an alternative, which has some bipartisan support, uh, called the Platform Accountability and Consumer Transparency Act, which is PACT for short, uh, focuses on requiring websites to report how they uh, moderate content transparent, transparently. Now over to the Republican side, um, where they're taking a wider tack in reforming Section 230. They're generally more unified in uh, their vision of reforms. Uh, starting with Attorney General Barr's recommendations came somewhat of a blueprint that was laid out to introduce new restrictions uh, on cyber stalking, terrorism, which would likely result in more proactive moderation efforts, along with measures uh, intended to punish arbitrary or discriminatory uh, moderation, kind of getting at that um, uh, vice against conservative um, line. So leading up to the 118th Congress, and we're in the 118th, um, you see a lot of these themes included in the commitment to America agenda, which is um, kind of the agenda that um, Falcons put out as their um, intended um, uh, goals for this uh, Congress. And that includes limiting the amount of big, big tech, the data that big tech is allowed to obtain from children, raising the age of children covered under the Children's Online Protection Privacy Act, uh, requiring big tech provisions that aid children experiencing cyberbullying and holding big tech liable for facilitating illegal activities. Now, some of these, many of these mix the Section 230 debate with content moderation, uh, but they do show where these overlap. And it leads us to the 118th, which is still a fairly young Congress to date. Um, and we're starting to see another interpretation by the Republican side of content moderation in Section 230. Um, I want everybody to keep in mind that in every Congress, especially ones where the House has flipped, uh, there's an extended time period where the ma new majority party uh, needs to signal to their base that they are fulfilling some of their campaign promises. Um, and they do that through legislation and hearings. And so this week, uh, the so-called uh, Twitter files led to a House Oversight Committee meeting uh, to hold a hearing on Twitter's role of removing critical con our content critical of then candidate Biden's son. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what, le what legislation comes from this endeavor as uh, Section 230 and the First Amendment usually work hand in hand to make any government action along this being very difficult from a constitutional perspective. 
and I'll get into kind of the core perspective later in this uh, conversation. Um, there's other legislation that um, give, hints at a different approach again from the new uh, Republican majority. Uh, this last month that was indicated or, or that was introduced called Protecting Speech from Government Interference Act. Uh, this aims to prohibit federal employees from censoring free speech or pressuring social media companies to censor speech. And this comes directly from our report and leaked email showing that DAHS was working with Meta um, even after closing down its very unpopular uh, disinformation governance board to address um, vaccine disinformation. And so from a bipartisan perspective, all of these things kind of merge together to make it as clear as mud uh, that there's no real clear path forward when it comes to Section 230 and content moderation that's bipartisan. Democrats don't seem very interested in regulating tech through a First Amendment lens, and Republicans don't seem very interested in content moderation through a mis- and disinformation perspective. Uh, we can see this playing out already. So, for example, the Republican-led uh, Anti-Social CCP Act focuses on countering foreign intelligence versus the PACT Act focuses on digital communication platforms, providing privacy-protected secure pathways for independent research. Um, and so there's a number of other bills that I can mention that kind of follow along these party lines, Social Media Nudge Act, um, the uh, Platform Integrity Act, HR 965 has some bipartisan interest, uh, which would amend the law to exclude instances such as uh, uh, such provider or user has promoted, suggested, amplified, or otherwise recommended such information on which um, an interactive computer services um, has, has, has led to negative harms. Um, Two areas that, um, so barring the content moderation and the Section 230 debate that's ongoing between the parties and in Congress, there are two other areas that have a clear path forward, which that includes competition and antitrust uh, reform, uh, especially in big tech and privacy. Um, for, so uh, last year, there was a competition proposal that gave momentum called the American Innovation and Online Choice Act and it showed that Republicans uh, who voted it out of committee uh, overwhelmingly supported proposals for reforms to antitrust when Democrats included provisions that would make it harder for tech platforms to moderate content in ways conservatives thought would disadvantage them. And at the same time, uh, Senator Cruz uh, said approvingly that um, this might make some uh, positive improvement in the problem of censorship because it would provide protections to content providers to businesses that are discriminated against because of the content that they produced. Uh, not, not to be outshone, uh, uh, Senate um, uh, Democrats introduced uh, or tried to amend the bill to account for this conservative windfall uh, and um, pushed to amend the AIOCA to include uh, content moderation provisions that would address hate speech. Uh, as far as I know, that was not included at the, in the amended bill in the 117th but there have been uh, renewed calls uh, by civil society advocates to uh, reintroduce the bill and Biden did uh, call for it directly in the State of the Union on Tuesday. Um, the other avenue I wanted to mention, um, which speaking of the State of the Union is privacy, Biden urged Congress to pass legislation aimed at protecting kids online or kids' pr privacy online, a move that's seen as encouraging but long overdue. Uh, the legislation he referenced is actually part of a package of bills, uh, including the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, known as COPA 2.0, and the Kids Online Safety Act, known as COSA. Uh, now, both would address some of the issues that I've heard this committee talk about throughout the week. Um, and while they're still billed as privacy bills, um, they would regulate content by providing clear rules for what platforms can do with children's data, uh, data minimization, and consent. Uh, with all things Washington, D.C., there is uh, some calling for a different approach. Um, so when these were these bills were voted out of committee, uh, despite bipartisan support, um, some lawmakers criticized their, their colleagues um, for not prioritizing another bill, which was the American Data Privacy Protection Act, or ADPPA. Um, and this is a bill that uh, would establish um, it's known as the Three Corners Bill because it represents buy-in from three of the four principles involved in uh, ongoing discussions around data privacy. Uh, but this is the closest that we've come to a national data privacy law. And it does have some specific children's provisions, namely uh, a youth 
privacy and marketing division at the FTC, which would be uh, responsible for addressing privacy and marketing concerns uh, to children and minors. The division would have to submit reports and hire staff, something also that I heard around youth development, uh, privacy, data protection, and uh, digital advertising and analytics. There are some conflicting provisions between these privacy bills, but they do represent uh, an interesting path forward on privacy and content moderation in Section 230. It's going to be a messy process to untangle or, or um, figure out a path forward between those three bills I mentioned. Uh, but uh, it is, as far as we uh, know, or we've seen uh, as the furthest we've gotten uh, in terms of the data privacy bill. So I want to shift a little bit to the Supreme Court, uh, looking at my time. So. Um, the um, debate that could uh, going on right now that could have a huge impact on Section 230, uh, which would supplement, would also have an impact on how Congress looks at it, is the Gonzalez v. Google case and the Twitter versus uh, Temina case. Uh, very quickly, if you're not familiar with Gonzalez v. Google or the Twitter case, um, the Gonzalez v. Google case looks at algorithms um, and whether they are protected under Section 230. Um, and um, the uh, the Twitter case, uh, the Supreme Court will be answering two questions: um, uh, whether the online service that regulate detects or deters terrorists from using services knowingly aided terrorism by taking greater steps to prevent such use, um, or not taking big, greater steps, or whether the service should be held liable for aiding and abetting terrorism under the Anti-Terrorist Act, amended by the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act. Um, so whether or not the platform knowingly provided assistance because it, it allegedly could have taken more meaningful or aggressive action to remove content. Um, and so in addition to these, so these two cases are going to be argued in our oral arguments will be happening in, in February and then decisions coming this summer. They'll have a huge impact on to uh, whether the courts want to limit the liability uh, under the, the different uh, case um, arguments that are presented. But in addition to this, uh, there are two, there are multiple lower court cases dealing with Section 230 uh, on content moder and content moderation, some of which will likely be heard again at the Supreme Court level. For example, the court blocked the uh, controversial Texas social media law from taking effect uh, after tech industry and other opponents warned. Uh, it could allow for hateful content and run rampant online. Uh, the decision does not rule on the merits of the case, uh, but imposes a, a reimposes an in, uh, injunction blocking it from taking effect uh, while the federal courts decide whether it can be enforced. Same with the Florida law, um, where the content, content moderation law is also under consideration and the appeals court also temporarily prevented it from taking event, uh, effect. Um, most recent update on that is that in January, the Supreme Court asked the Solicitor General to review both cases. Um, and this is a much uh, more established path for the Supreme Court to look at these legal issues. Um, the emergence of a circuit split with the Fifth Circuit ruling to, up, ruling to uphold the Texas law and the Eleventh Circuit ruling to strike down the Florida law. Um, this is where the Supreme Court steps in and takes up legal issues in question. So. Um, in Washington, uh, you can already see the impact of these uh, court cases on uh, policymakers and legislators because they're waiting to see what the court uh, does besides before moving forward. There's been a lot of uh, quiet conversations happening around privacy and content moderation in Section 230, but the biggest elephant in the room right now is what the Supreme Court's gonna do on Section 230. And while the courts uh, consider the cases, new lawsuits are also uh, adding to the litigation landscape. Uh, for example, a lawsuit brought by Louisiana Attorney General Jeff Laundry and then Missouri Attorney General Eric Schmidt um, named uh, several uh, cabinet secretary members um, in the lawsuit for suppressing social media, um, including the Hunter Biden story and information about origins of COVID-19. Um, so only adding to the complexity there is what's happening at the state level. And it's worth mentioning that legislators are looking into these issues, notably California, New York, Florida, and Texas. Um, I don't have time to get into this area, uh, of, but it's having a national impact in that these laws are getting challenged in the court and they're rising through the court systems, like I mentioned in the, New York, or the, the Florida and the, the Texas laws. Um, and there's also emerging trends happening at the state level where you can 
to see things like Ron DeSanto's legislation, leg legislative agenda starting to have uh, impact in other states, uh, as well as California's um, content moderation starting to be seen in other states as well uh, in terms of influence. Uh, in conclusion, um, you know, the path forward remains, um, in my opinion, through child privacy initiatives. Uh, it remains one of the more bipartisan supported areas, uh, even in this new House Republican majority. Uh, the one area I didn't discuss was the FTC's role uh, and what, uh, how it could play a role in this debate and the Biden administration and the dynamics we usually see between uh, a more activist regulatory agency and uh, a reactionary uh, Congress where um, the opposing party has taken issue with uh, decisions that were made there. Um, I would say look for more to come from courts later this month in June, as I mentioned in the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, in October, um, I would expect there to be a, a fair amount of um, new content or Section 230 bills introduced because that's generally when we see the most bills uh, introduced in Congress. But with that, thank you very much for uh, listening and, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tom, if I may. Um, I'm not going to ask uh, Professor Christopher Yu, Professor at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, to uh, moderate the Q&A. Christopher. Well, thank you very much to all the speakers and thank you, Sandro, for handing it off to me. Uh, Christopher, just one, one thing. Um, your voice is very faint. I was wondering if there's a microphone issue. There probably is. Hold on. Well, I don't know that that's, I only have one microphone now. I will probably dial, I'm going to dial in, but in the meantime, I'm going to launch us off. If there's any questions, uh, this is a time for the members of the committee to ask questions. I welcome any that you might have. Please indicate in the usual fashion by raising your hand. If there are no questions, I will start taking the moderator's privilege by asking the first. Um, so the question I have is directed to Professor Murthy, talking about accountability. And one of the questions you had about the difficulty in assessing platforms and how they behave. I found myself wondering um, to what extent assessment is about the functioning of the algorithm itself or its outputs. We know that even if you have a neutrally designed platform, it has outputs, it's a, an emergent phenomena of what outputs of emergent scale. And it occurred to me that if you put all the emphasis on the outputs, you can actually try to do testing along the lines of what we think of as zero knowledge proofs or the like, where you focus on that and it actually eliminates the need to understand what's under the hood. So what strikes me, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on input versus output testing or formal uh, elements of the algorithm testing versus output testing. Of course. Um, so I, this is not my area, and so I feel a little bit like I was drinking out of a fire hose, um, and I really appreciate the thoroughness of all the presentations. Um, and so I'm, you know, there's a lot of references to like the algorithms and um, like ethical AI, and some of these spaces, um, they're clearly not shaped for youth. And so I'm curious if the, anyone has insights into any of the algorithm formatting that might address youth, uh, ethical boards that talk about youth, or any piece of that. Yeah. Okay. So maybe I could just give it give it a try with the uh, uh, with with answering how this can uh, how this can be um, what what I see at least for now. So I mentioned the youth councils, which are part of the uh, the um, Australian e safety commissioner's um, uh, office, um, and also the uh, there's the duty of care in the online uh, safety bill in the UK, um, and we'll have youth councils in the OSMR in Ireland. Uh, from my perspective, that is an opportunity to involve uh, youth. Uh, I'm sorry, I keep hearing myself in a very strange way. So from just from 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 my perspective, that that is a way to uh, at least provide to actually mandate the the provision of child uh, you, I mean youth feedback uh, in the design of these processes. So, um, from my perspective, uh, there, there really has to be a way to actually, once the company starts building a specific, as they call it, online safety product, 
um, a few days ago, Sonia was talking about child rights impact, impact assessment. As part of that process, uh, young people's feedback um, should be uh, asked for at the very, so at the very early stages of the design of any product that has impact on young people. So any kind of algorithm that specifically set um, uh, to target a specific issue, because of course there are many different algorithms that are designed for different purposes within the platform. So anything that is really uh, designed to address cyberbullying needs to be built from ground up with young people's feedback. So for instance, um, young people know what types of bullying are happening that we as adults just might not be privy to. So we might not know um, might not know ways in which very subtle bullying happens. Um, and so having their feedback from the very beginning in terms of the more nuanced types of bullying would be one way um, to actually, my view, to do that, um, if, that might, if that makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, I think what happened is it went to my webcam's microphone. <laughs> so I just saw that. Okay, um, hopefully this works okay. Um, so uh, thank you for the question. I'll just kind of, you know, repeat a bit of it since it's been a bit of, bit of time. The, the question was regarding some of the differences between um, input assessment versus output um, assessments. Um, that, that's grossly simplified, but I'll try to respond. In a way, I think it references a little bit of what Professor Zitrin um, was talking about with the idea of gift shrunk, um, with the, the notion here that, um, you know, we potentially could get more data, but that would also be more output oriented. I'd be, one of the ways to resolve the, the conundrum, you know, you're talking about here would be for gift shrunk to potentially also, you know, include um, uh, elements of code or elements of going, you know, behind the hood in some way. I think that the biggest reason why I went this way was the lack of ability to look on the input side, because it would be great to be able to do causal testing or be able to see what users see, because on the side of YouTube, for example, I can only speculate what users could be saying. I can't and I didn't in my article say users definitively, you know, saw all these recommendations because only, um, you know, YouTube's going to hold that data. So I guess part of the thing um, I, I, I'm saying in response to this is I completely agree with you. There's there's limitations in this sort of methodologies of looking at, um, you know, coming at from a zero knowledge approach and then trying to analyze the outputs and piece something together through reverse engineering. But I guess my point is it may be one of the only methods we have unless you partner with a social with a social media company, and then as Professor Zitrin was saying, it's unlikely you'll unlikely you'll ever publish that, given um, the the PNAS article you know he mentioned um, with the researchers from Cornell, where everyone said, "Why did you do that?" sort of work. So it's this interesting space. I don't know if I've quite answered your question, but I guess it probably reveals some of the tension I'm feeling myself in not having access to the input side or be able to do causal sort of work. Thank you very much. Sharon. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, the question I, I have is uh, following up on uh, the question that Stephanie was, was asking uh, to, uh, um, uh, to Dr. Milosevic. Um, and so in your presentation, you told us about like one uh, thing that was quite interesting to me was this idea of school accounts to report cyberbullying. In some ways, that sort of scales like it, it makes it such that it's sort of moderation is sort of more local and it scales things up so there are some interesting aspects to it but it is like we were also saying that there is sort of social norms of self-reliance like student like kids don't that don't want to report things i'm wondering if there's any uh work or ideas around sort of self-governance in a way like self not like self-individual but self as a community of kids that are like so not account of some uh, you know higher institution like a school, but uh, ideas around uh, basically moderation that would scale things up in this sort of more community oriented way. Is there any anything in there, or is that sort of, uh, or, or would you even consider that as a as a viable option? So that's a it's a very interesting question. I actually haven't considered it in my work. I know that community there has been research on community moderation. Um, I actually don't think it's in the context of youth from 
Nathan Matias and uh, some of the colleagues. So I can I can share that. Uh, um, and that was in the context of Reddit, I think. And so but I don't think it really concerns uh, uh, specifically youth. I haven't explored that that option in my work and I haven't seen um, uh, other work that actually explores that. But it is an interesting avenue. My only concern in that respect is that uh, I, I, I think that it really, uh, as I was saying, I think that it defers in a way it, responsibility to the endpoint, to the user. Um, and I, I think that leaving it on its own in that way uh, and framing it as just young people's empowerment and user empowerment has its limitations. So I think that there has to be a way to uh, still keep the company engaged rather than just uh, uh, saying, here are these uh, uh, ways that young people can be empowered. Um, but I certainly think that uh, there are uh, there's space to actually explore that as an option. As regards to schools and reporting to schools, I, I didn't get to talk about that. But in our research, it came up again that uh, young people, and this is perhaps to be expected, it is expected to me, uh, that young people really were reluctant to, to get the school involved at all. Um, and I guess we as in, in cyberbullying community as researchers are very hostile <laughs> to what young people are telling us because we keep towing the line of giving young people advice, talk to someone. Um, and it, it's clear that we keep getting this feedback really that uh, young people um, uh, don't feel understood and seen very often by adults. Um, so I think these are approaches to be explored. Um, and also if I if I find those, I'll find actually those papers that I was thinking of and, and I can share that with you. Um, but yeah, um, it could be as, as part of, I'm not sure how that could be institutionalized and maybe actually the, the ongoing establishment of the online safety commissioner's office um, might actually uh, be really the place to take that question up. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much. Yes, I was I was aware of the other current debates of uh, uh, you know efforts, but not the, so. This is this was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Miguel. Well, thanks. Uh, so to to Dr. Milosevic. So um, how can we? Or I would I was very interested to think your thoughts about the extent of content moderation in in the cyber world, where where we can think that. You know, we could see that social media is just another place where where bullying can happen, right? So just like a, another type of playground, right? So if I, I so the content moderation would come like from the fact that I I might post something offensive, right? Then my comment would be take, taken down, right? Just like right. some someone hitting someone in the playground is stopped, right? But I think that now we have a layer on, on the cyber dimension that my own posts can be used against me, right? Mm -hmm. So like my own posting in good, in good, and you know, posting a picture of me or whatever, yeah, right? Absolutely, that's a very can, common way of- Can that. be harmful to me as well, right? So I would like to know your thoughts about the extent of, of content moderation where, where my own post, post could actually harm me, right? So uh, thank you for, for the question. If I'm understanding you correctly, you're asking when someone is repurposing my posts, so editing them in some way and making them hurtful um, and directing them against me. Yeah, yeah, but it could be that. But but at the end of the day, the origin, right? It, it's on myself. Like this, the the the, the origin sure. of the of the data, the origin of information it starts yeah. from me, right? Yeah. Someone yeah. takes it and against me, but but I am the one who generated right the information yeah. that is used. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and it, it is a. From what I've seen, it is, of course, a, it's a common way of uh, of of bullying, so to speak. So, um, uh, hateful commentary on something that someone posted, and then repurposing that and making it into a mockery. Um, those posts, if 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 I understood you, those posts can be you can report that post as well. So that's it. It's 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 not. I'm not sure if you're asking me whether that prevents the moderation system from actually intervening because it's my original post. To my knowledge, no. As long as the company can actually establish that there has been either a change or that it's repurposed for hurtful um, communication against me, it can still be actioned as cyberbullying. So it doesn't prevent the platform from intervening. And certainly it amplifies um, 
it amplifies uh, the scope of what's possible uh, and, and uh, it, it really the amount of hurt that can be generated. Um, because it really, if, if you, especially if you post it, a lot of this is about identity expression. And if you posted something uh, uh, in a way that uh, uh, you're communicating how you see yourself and someone flips that completely uh, and turns it into a mockery against you, it turns, uh, and especially for a developing young person, it, it takes another psychological level of torment, but that can be established as uh, cyberbullying by the platform and can be reported and taken down. Uh, but in terms of the playground thing, if I can just say very often cyberbullying is, is framed as just this uh, 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 another form of playground. Um, but it is really, uh, uh, and I, I actually really uh, object when uh, online or, or cyber, which is a very, um, uncommon way of young people uh, using that kind of, they don't see that as, as cyber, that's just life. And when, when it's framed as offline real life versus <laughs> online, they don't uh, distinguish it that way. It's just, it's not even an extension of life. It's just life. Um, and uh, it's seamless, uh, that, that kind of uh, uh, um, uh, a border. I, there is no border. Um, and so just that as a sort of a commentary. Uh, but but definitely it it, it amplifies uh, and can be to my knowledge it can be regulated. I Thank hope you. This answers it. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions. Sharon. Um, thank you. The uh, the quest, this question is uh, um, uh, to, uh, to Tom. So it was very helpful to get a list of all these uh, efforts that are ongoing. Um, uh, the one thing that you did mention uh, was that the child privacy initiatives are sort of the most bipartisan, perhaps the ones that you're seeing sort of most um, potential in. I'm, uh, as I think through some of the uh, presentations that we heard so far, the thing that, that, that is really emphasized quite a lot is um, involvement of of the the kids and the youth themselves and and sort of uh, you know uh, we've seen examples of that today as well and like what needs to be done so I'm just curious um, from your reading of the initiatives so far uh, degree to which these kinds of characteristics are part of uh, the existing efforts or uh, like I guess how flexible are these current initiatives in in, in terms of getting us uh, to some of these uh, aspects that seem to be highlighted quite a lot in the in the previous uh, few weeks. Um, like what, to what extent kids have input in the legislation process or? Or I mean, I guess the, the, the things that are being uh, uh, the, uh, so I, I, unfortunately I haven't read uh, through uh, some of these initiatives and the things that are being proposed. I'm just curious uh, degree to which they're uh, sort of more, uh, like top down versus uh, things that are uh, initiatives that are uh, highlighting some of these uh, important aspects that are being mentioned here, such as uh, you know the degree to which the uh, the uh, the kids and, and youth will be involved in the process of uh, some of these uh, procedural changes. Yeah. So um, from uh, uh, let's just go with like the kind of child centric legislation, uh, COSA, the COPA. Um, those are um, legislation proposals that are working together. So it's very much uh, the legislators were wanting to update old laws and create uh, new regulations around what um, companies can do with children's data specifically. And it doesn't necessarily hit on section 230 or content moderation, it's just what the data they can do with it. Um, one of the big drivers of that is a lot of um, concern around targeted advertising to uh, the youth. Um, and so there's one, a lot of, uh, provisions in there to try to limit that. Now with the ADPPA, uh, it's a much bigger legislation package that includes things like children's provisions, but it's not specifically geared towards children. It's part of the package. Um, and it took many years for folks behind that bill to, to craft it. It also includes, includes things like algorithmic, um, uh, uh, regulations and, 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 you know, transparency requirements there. One thing that we're seeing is that with uh, Gonzales v. Google uh, Supreme Court happening, it's already kind of unpending the, this uh, comprehensive privacy package and that people are calling for us to review, or the U.S. legislator to um, 
uh, review the algorithmic part of ADPPA. Um, and so um, there's, there's slow kind of cuts by a thousand, uh, or death by a thousand cuts happening there, unless it gets pushed forward versus the, the kind of more children centric ones. Those are much more established. Uh, Kathy, uh, 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 CMR is her name. Uh, she's a, often said that, and she's one of the one of the the main uh, influencers on on data privacy and children. She's a parent herself, and so she's often said, "I want to protect my kids from online um, negative externalities." Um, so there's that aspect of it of kind of parents being concerned and and contributing to that kind of push to keep the legislation alive. In terms of um, of how concrete these things are, we're in a new Congress, which means new negotiations. Um, and new um, kind of priorities. Although, um, you know, the Republicans have put out their agenda uh, commitment to America, you can see kind of the, the thread from Attorney General Barr's blueprint to that, to some of the legislative proposals that are coming up. But I wouldn't look for anything currently because right now the House Republicans are very much looking to signal to their base that they're addressing other issues, including Hunter Biden and Twitter files and things like that. So wait to a little bit further in this Congress, which is somewhat of a, it's like a, a, a shoot yourself in the foot situation because the longer you wait to address these things, the more stagnant the momentum comes and uh, the more opportunities for things like court cases to poke holes in the legislation. So I would like to ask a question of Dr. Gerard. Um, you described a fascinating phenomenon and we are attempting to do a, a data-based or empir empirically grounded assessment. And I found it more helpful in describing a phenomenon, putting on my radar and my next reaction is how in the world would we study a phenomenon which, which rises so unexpectedly and abruptly and then collapses so quickly and trying to assess its relative impact. I mean, you're familiar with this phenomenon more than we are. Can you, any words of wisdom or help or assistance that you might be able to provide? Thank you so much for that question. Yeah, it's, yes, <laughs> that's the absolute right question to be asking. I think, one of the one of the things that I find really frustrating is that if an app pops up by the time you get ethics approval to you know do any kind of in-app I don't know what it would be whether it would be kind of you know textual analysis or whether it would be more of a scraping approach you know whatever you're going to do with the data by the time you get your ethics approval the app could have died it could be gone um, and also a lot of the content and conversations on these apps happens in you know, the kind of equivalent of, say, a direct message on Instagram or a direct message on Facebook or whatever. So it's not as publicly visible as, say, tweets or comments on public TikTok videos or whatever. So it's it's a phenomenon that is really hard to just get the raw information. Um, and so I think that the starting point for me needs to be I that this is one of the reasons I think it's useful to have these kind of like subgenres is because then instead of it being you know research on you know YOLO research on LMK research on secret or whatever instead of focusing on the app you focus on the genre to which it belongs which then enables you to you know engage in research where you could take any one of those apps and either study the content and or study people's perceptions and experiences and you know go directly to kids and say how are you experiencing this can you walk me through some of the things um you know that happen on there so I think to me you know instead of making it kind of app or company centric we broaden it out into these subgenres and we group apps yeah. together and then we avoid that kind of you start a project on an app and then it dies. And then what are you left with as a researcher? So to me, that's one approach. Um, I don't know if it's the best one, but it's the one that I've been trying to take. Um, but thank you for that question. I really hope that my answer clarifies a few things. Thank you. Miguel, please. So uh, to Professor Murthy, so you, you just went over and showed us that that even even it's so extremely difficult to actually see under the hood 
but like we, if we were to see under the hood, it's very likely very messy, very dynamic, millions of lines of code, very hard to disentangle pieces. So my question is about feasibility, right? So how, do you think, or how, how, how feasible do you think it is to actually partition the question of content moderation between what, what kids get versus adults, right? Because you showed us extreme example, like something that is really illegal, right? Something that is very on the extreme. But, but when we are talking about kids, right? Of course, there are some, of course, there are illegal aspects, right? But there are, we're also worried about some stuff that kids get exposed to that might not be illegal, right? So, so it's not such a clean cut. So my question is how feasible this actually, it's actually to, to think about differential content moderation, right? For the, con, for the kids uh, versus, right, uh, adults and, and taking into account the degree of, of, of illegality or, or, or things that we might not be as, as clean cut for the kids. Yeah, thank you, Miguel, for, for your question. I really appreciate the opportunity actually to talk about some of my other work, which isn't as extreme um, because actually, um, that, that work, not only to being very extreme, was a pretty uh, challenging work for me to do myself. Um, and, and I agree with you, it, it's, it's an extreme case. It's not always going to be as applicable to some of the questions you're asking. So I'll tell you a little bit about the work I'm doing in regards to vaping and electronic cigarettes, which is legal in many countries, but isn't probably a good idea for minors to you know consume especially at, at very young ages and it's sometimes you know legal sometimes isn't so in that case um what you know i've tried to do in that work is and this answers your question of feasibility in line with complexity so again in these platforms not being able to go behind the hood are we able to build for example classifiers to be able to look at the ages of users and also build classifiers to look at the appropriateness of content. So what I'm trying to do in this line of work is um, also do content moderation on platforms. These are platforms like Instagram, like um, TikTok, um, uh, Be Real, um, you know, and others is to go through and then try to map out what the prevalence of, for example, vape and e-cigarette content is then try to do identification of age groups and see if those minors are being exposed. Because in some cases, those platforms have policies saying explicitly to things such as electronic cigarettes, nicotine, tobacco, that they are going to implement age restrictions. But the, the, the thing is, and this is definitely going to speak to you know, some of the other presenters who are more focused on you know, youth, is that people are going to lie about their ages on the platform. So the platforms often will say, I'm above this age. So the platforms with age gating features will then release that content to them because they've said they're over 18. So one of the arguments I'm trying to make here in response to your question is, it is feasible, it is really tough to build machine learned classifiers to try to predict the ages of these people. There are many different methods we're using. Part of it is a sort of stuff they're putting in their feeds, but also maybe their profile photo to do computer vision for age analysis, but it's really hard, but we're doing it. Um, but I, and I think it's also necessary because then we can go back to the platforms and say, hey, you're saying in your terms and conditions or your other guidelines that you're not showing tobacco content to people who are 13, but you're doing it regularly. And that, you know, has a likelihood of encouraging them to, you know, take up vaping or something. So I hope that answers your question. Like I completely agree that age-related analyses um, are important. I will just add in response to your question, it's extremely challenging like to do and do reliably, but there are methods to do it. And I think more people should be doing it. Thank you again. Thanks, thanks. Other questions? Chair. Um, thank you. Uh, th this question is uh, to Dr. Gerard. Um, like Christopher was saying, really interesting. Um, so uh, the thing that you shared about, like what is a challenge for them, or so I think you said something like, if they don't fail because they're unpopular, they fail because they're popular and they can't uh, deal with the scale of moderation. Um, I'm wondering, um, if we were trying to you know, propose changes so that it seems like maybe it is too much to put uh, more work on small uh, apps, 
uh, the role that you would think like operating systems that these apps sort of uh, are run on uh, can be can play or can be can be forced to play in terms of you know basically sort of being able to process the data and uh, on the user end and like basically so I guess I know it's it might be a little, a little bit too much in the weeds but like thinking through if that is a challenge and if it's this is these are spaces that are allowing youth to express themselves and and uh, we want to make sure that they are they're sort of supported what are uh, like are, are people thinking through uh, different levels in which uh, this kind of intervention can be done to be able to make sure that moderate at least moderation is done uh, in a in a reliable way thank you thank you so much for that question sorry my cat appeared halfway through um <laughs> I think I mean one of the things I mentioned towards the end um so I'm not aware of any kind of direct attempts to intervene into content moderation for anonymous apps specifically i'm not it doesn't mean it doesn't exist i'm just not aware of it but one of the things that the that is happening in the uk that kind of would have an effect on the apps but isn't yet sort of what i, I would sort of say good enough um is the uk's online safety bill um that i sort of brought up quite briefly towards the end so they're trying to um, essentially regulate apps and platforms according to the tier to which they belong. So tier one and tier two and the definitions, you know, it's obviously an ongoing project, um, but the definitions are quite fuzzy at the moment, but they're kind of linked to not just kind of the number of users, um, but the potential reach and then also the vulnerability of potential users so you know is this app or platform likely to be used by children if so it might go from a tier two to a tier one or vice versa um and so it and it kind of it it has different rules and requirements it's it's implying that certain apps and platforms need to have different rules and requirements than others and i really like that approach um but but it misses and it's it's really frustrating to just not have answers, but it, it really misses that gap where you you could essentially go from a tier two to a tier one overnight. You know, you literally could go there, you know, sort of sort of overnight. And I think one of the solutions that I've been thinking through, and it's kind of I think it might be an unpopular solution, but you know, if you've got if you've got an anonymous app company or any startup that gets very big very quickly and you you know your service is likely to be used by children you're not going to be able to scale it up in terms of a human workforce in enough time so maybe smaller companies that deal with children as users that deal with particularly controversial kinds of communication like anonymity need to be more reliant on AI versions of content moderation or other automated forms of content moderation in the beginning until they have scaled up the organization enough to be able to say that they are employing a human workforce that is able to to meet the job requirements and kind of meet those levels of safety um it's that's not me like you know AI is the solution to everything but I just think that it makes sense um in that scenario but again it's it's a really contentious debate and i'm not aware of of where it's happening and who's having those conversations so yeah so thank you for the question it's really thought provoking well we are almost at time and we've had a great deal of questions uh we probably have time for one more if any of the committee members have another question if not i shall send it back to sandro Thank you, thank you, Christopher. Very good. Thank you, everybody. First of all, thank you to our um, our speakers. Really, with a with a terrific uh, lineup of speakers, we learned from every single one of you. And thank you for bearing with us as we had a few technical glitches, but I'm, I'm delighted we sorted them all out. Um, um, and uh, thank you to Christopher for uh, facilitating. Uh, why don't we uh, take a break um, until uh, four o'clock Eastern, one o'clock Pacific? Um, uh, people can log off and log back on or keep your uh, logged on and just turn your cameras and uh, microphones on so we'll restart it right at four eastern thank you everybody all right very good why don't we uh, reconvene um uh, thank you to our new guests who have joined us
We're now going to move to a panel discussion on content moderation, and I'm going to turn this over to Professor Munwan De Chaudhry, Professor at Georgia Tech University, who will be leading the session. Munwan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Galia. So uh, we have three speakers in this session on content moderation, and uh, we are going to go through each of the speakers before opening it up for questions. So we'll use the same format we have been so far. Our first speaker is going to be Ms. Britton Heller, who is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and also an affiliate with the Stanford Cyber Policy Center. Thank you for having me here today. I'm just checking that you up. You can all hear me before I start. It's a pleasure to be here and to be in the company of, um, of all of you with such interesting research and, and, and a great focus on the, the well being of youth and children. What I'm going to talk to you about today is augmented and virtual reality, collectively known as XR, and how those pose big challenges for content moderation going forward. There are three point, main points that I'm going to make in, in, in my very short uh, time today. One, it is a mistake to presume that content moderation in XR, which is spatial computing, is like pre-existing social media. Two, this is because there are different stack later, layers or moderation vectors in spatial computing. And three, there is a lack of automated solutions or AI will not save us here. First, um, it's a presumption to, to treat this like social media. There are different impacts on users. XR is psychologically and neurologically different than socializing in video games, in, uh, in web-based social media, or interacting with others on social networks. And this is because of the way the neuroscience works. When you are in XR, it's more akin to inviting a stranger into your house and having them sit at your dining room table rather than harsh words you read on the web or getting in a heated argument with somebody on a Twitter feed. Tom Furness, who is one of the pioneers of XR, says when you have experiences in this medium, they are retained, quote, like they are drawn in the brain in permanent ink. This is because the way your brain processes these experiences, it goes through your hippocampus. And that's the same way that you create memories. When XR works, you have this sense of presence, meaning that the virtual world is your actual world, and immersion, meaning that you you are, are fully in this digitized environment. It results in the, making the mental separation between you and the objects of your interaction minimal at best. This is very, very useful for educational or therapeutic experiences, but it's very problematic for other types of experiences in virtual worlds, like gaming that involves committing acts of violence or instances of harassment. I'm a former prosecutor and I have, um, I have worked with a woman who claims that she was assaulted in VR. And I, I have to tell you that from my experience working with victims of sexual assault, she, she has all of the psychological and behavioral attributes of having been a victim of a physical assault, even though it happened in the virtual world. Two, there are different stack layers or moderation vectors when you go to spatial computing. When you look at content moderation in a web-based environment, many scholars boil it down to the moderation of content and the moderation of conduct. This is a little different. There is a content layer, and these are what you would consider individual immersive experiences, kind of akin to software. So VR games, AR games, social AR and VR workplaces. There's a conduct layer, which hosts user-to-user -user interactions and interactivity between users in their environment. But there's a third layer also when you move into a third dimension of computing, 
And this is the environmental or architectural layer. In VR, when you're looking at moderation, you, ha you have to moderate in three dimensions if you are going to be interacting in a three-dimensional space. Uh, additionally, there's also the account layer where users register and access features of an immersive platform. And if you look in gaming, people have been able to harass others using screen names or other administrative features. But th the main difference is really this environmental layer. And Lego actually found that it almost bankrupted its XR venture when it tried to prevent adolescent boys from terraforming penises into a virtual world. Given all of these different type of layers and the different formation of the tech stack, what type of content moderation should be in place for virtual worlds? Well, uh, third point, there is a lack of automated solutions based on, on where we are in the development of these digital spaces. Most web-based platforms, Facebook, Twitter, all of the, the ones that most people are familiar with, rely heavily on artificial intelligence to do their content moderation. Right now, the moderation space in XR looks, looks there's three, th three ways it looks like. Mostly, one, it's not done. It's just an, an unmoderated space. Two, if it is moderated, it relies on user reporting and flagging. So it puts the burden of moderation on the communities that participate in these spaces almost wholly. And three, it runs content in XR through a voice to text filter and then runs that through the social media web-based mechanisms moderation system. This is highly, highly ineffective. It does not pick on gestures. It does not pick up on interactions with virtual objects or architecture. It provides confusion to which enforcement rules apply in a space. Uh, in Horizon Worlds, there is a content, conduct and content in VR policy. But if content is being fed into the Facebook moderation mechanism, it's very confusing to, <laughs> to my lawyer brain what regime actually governs in this space. There are very few best practices as well. There's a dual tier, um, the best practice so far is having a dual tiered moderation system that's community-based. And this comes from MOOCs and gaming and platforms like Reddit. There's also a lack of automated solutions because we have a lack of classifiers for running AI in 3D environments. And this technology is far off. There is a real time need to modify conduct, content, and, um, and environment, which separates it from social media. And a final point is that uh, generative AI looks like a promising tool to help in this regard, but it does not yet have the discretion or contextual understanding that would be necessary for the nuance required for content moderation. In essence, it could supplant a human moderator, but it is not at the, in the position yet to replace a human moderator. I'm gonna end there and I'm looking forward to all your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Heller. And I uh, missed mentioning that um, Ms. Heller spoke to us about how augmented and virtual reality systems are posing significant challenges to content moderation. So thank you for that. And our next speaker uh, is Evelyn Duick. Uh, Ms. Duick is an assistant professor of law at Stanford Law School and also a senior research fellow at the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. So the question we have for you, the panel has for you, uh, Ms. Duick, is we heard earlier today, our instinct with content moderation online is that we often try to imitate something like a due process that we have um, in, um, uh, in other contexts and how it plays out over you know, many other individual con uh, content moderation decisions. Uh, you've said that adapting this type of system to online content moderation can produce you know, something like an accountability theater than actual accountability. So what we would be keen to hear from you is how you would describe the system strategies for content moderation uh, that could be more useful. Great, uh, thank you so much for the question and uh, for the opportunity to be here to get today to talk about this important topic. Um, so 
what I want to do in response to the question is just take a bit of a step back and uh, define what we're talking about here. So when we're talking about content moderation, I sort of think about it quite broadly as the rules and systems that platforms use to determine how they treat user generated content on their services. So the things that users do and post um, on, on their services. And the, the reason why I think about it broadly is because often we think about actually the conversation thinks about content moderation quite narrowly. So it thinks about it as here are the sets of rules that these platforms have in their community standards. And then here are how, how they apply them to individual uh, pieces of content to leave them up or take them down. Um, very much like to the lawyers uh, amongst us, it looks very similar to how we think about speech adjudication in a judicial context. Um, so here's a legislative rule, here's a speech act or uh, expressive conduct, and then how do we uh, apply in, in, in um, how do we apply that rule to that uh, e expression? Um, and that leads to uh, to implementing in content moderation many of the similar kinds of uh, protect, protective uh, safeguards and accountability mechanisms that we are used to from the judicial process, which include all of these due process mechanisms of advance notice of, and clarity in the rules, uh, reasons for any decision, the opportunity to appeal and the opportunity to, to present one's case uh, and, and, and things like that that are, that are important in the offline context. Um, but one of the things I think it's really important to emphasize is the way in which um, online content moderation is really different to offline speech regulation. Um, and so to sort of give you um, a, a picture, a flavor of, of why it's so different, um, in the third quarter of 2022, um, Facebook took down 23,339 pieces of content and YouTube took down 5,653 channels, videos, and comments every minute, <laughs> every single minute. So in the time that I've been speaking, they've already taken down like over 50,000 pieces of content and uh, on, on Facebook. Um, by contrast, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States has uh, decided approximately 247 First Amendment cases in its entire uh, in its entire history. So, uh, really, sort of thinking about these through the same kinds of lens um, that we, we do, I think, is, is leads us to um, misleading uh, uh, solutions and and misleading forms of accountability for the kinds of the most important decisions that platforms make. And those decisions sort of happen upstream of before that content is created, before that content um, is reviewed by a, a human reviewer, in terms of the kinds of affordances that platforms give users to create certain kinds of content and to interact with other kinds of, uh, interact with other users, and also the, the affordances that they give users to uh, create protective mechanisms for themselves and the ways in which that they can protect themselves uh, from interact, uh, from having negative interactions and negative experiences online. And so, I, I want to push uh, people to think about content moderation much more broadly um, to, to encompass uh, those kinds of measures. If I can just give one example of my favorite kind of um, content moderation mechanism that falls outside of this, this paradigm um, is a, a little nudge. I actually don't know if Twitter does this anymore, uh, but a little nudge that Twitter uh, used to give, maybe still does, um, when you go to retweet a story that you haven't read. Um, and if you go to retweet a piece of news, uh, a news article that you haven't read, a little thing will pop up and say, hey, read this before you spread it. Um, and you can just go, no, I'm going to keep spreading this piece of content without reading it because the headline makes me angry or something along those lines. Um, but Twitter found that 40% more people uh, read the article before they spread it as a result of that tiny little architectural sort of nudge, um, which in many ways is going to be a much more effective tool uh, for changing the way that a platform works and the kind of content on the platform and the experience that users have on the platform than trying to uh, clean up um, clean up things after they happen. And so thinking about um, risks and 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 uh, things before um, products are, are put out in the world and thinking about the possible vectors uh, for abuse and thinking about the ways in which to put in structural safeguards um, and constant quality assurance that things are working the way that they're supposed to be working and the way that um, Britain mentioned sort of the, the artificial intelligence tools that platforms use to do content moderation to, to ensure that those are operating effectively and in an on, non, on 
unbiased manner, all of those kinds of systemic uh, tools and checks are, are going to be the kinds of things that are much more effective to, to bringing accountability than just thinking about these due process sort of after the facts ex, ex post um, fixes for what we might think of as problematic content moderation decisions. So that's the kind of the push that I try and make in my work uh, to be thinking about this much more from an ex ante system design perspective rather than the ex post uh, remedies perspective that we're often used to thinking about these kinds of issues, uh, especially um, the, the lawyers amongst us. Thank you, Ms. Jewick. All right, so third we have uh, Ms. Amy Hasanoff, who is an associate professor and director of graduate studies of the Department of Communication um, at the University of Colorado in Denver. So Ms. Hasanoff, um, if you're talking about how, um, uh, talking about changing strategies for content moderation, um, it also helps to think about, be more specific about maybe about the shortcomings of our existing systems, right? So some of your work has mentioned um, a failure uh, to account for context as a central problem with many existing content moderation systems. So I was hoping that you could give us some examples of how to account for this context in content moderation and how might this be done you know, at different scales. Thanks for the question and thanks you, thank you for having me here and thank you to all the organizers for um, such a wonderful day uh, of panels and, and questions um, and commentary. So uh, in relation to context, of course, that's a big question. Um, I want to start by um, just talking about how, of course, platforms are designed for scale primarily. Um, we heard uh, about that uh, today um, from Dr. Gerard, especially about how this rapid growth um, without uh, the necessary um, moderation capacity results in these sort of spectacular um, failures. But it, of course, in order to have a platform that can scale rapidly, it needs to rely on automated systems um, and or some combination of usually underpaid or low paid humans who essentially end up applying rules in a robot like manner. Um, so you need like top down rules that you can kind of apply uh, universally. Um, and this, of course, results in a, a lack of context, a lack of nuance, um, and a lot of problems that, that come along with that, because these top down rules can result in a moderation decisions that feel really unfair, um, that feel really problematic, that don't address harm in the way that they should, and that probably conflict with local community norms in a lot of cases, because there isn't um, really a good place um, for context to come in there. And the other problem with this um, sort of top-down universal rules um, application system that we basically have on a, on a lot of the big platforms um, is that it's not a great way to learn about what's okay and what's not okay, what's harmful, what's not harmful, what are the norms uh, of being in a community, of being in an online space, of just being a human, uh, which of course is especially important for young people and children, but is important for all of us, obviously, uh, as we can see with all of the problems that happened, uh, happen on platforms. Uh, sometimes we are not even told by platforms what rules we broke, right? Which is just your banned, your shadow banned. You may not even know that you've been shadow banned. Uh, your content has been demoted because uh, someone reported you. So you haven't learned anything about how to be better. Um, and so there's there's this way in which that um, we're lacking uh, all of these responses that could be more, more useful. Um, we're lacking follow-up. Uh, we heard uh, also from Dr. Milosevic uh, about this problem of lack of follow-up. Of course, many researchers have identified that as well, what happens when your content is reported, right? Um, and so what alternatives exist for uh, accounting for context. Uh, I'm not going to give you a simple answer because there is obviously not one, but at the same time, there is kind of a simple and obvious answer. It's just applying it is difficult. How do you account for context? You have to involve the people who are being moderated. And we often don't do this, especially on the big for-profit platforms because it's so complicated to do it. Um, and Dr. Milosevic also talked about youth participation, right? I think that's so important to, to think about how can youth and adults um, be more involved in the decisions about moderation because currently, uh, 
Um, there aren't a lot of uh, built-in systems for doing this on the biggest uh, platforms, though there are small ways like Facebook groups might have a, a moderator, subreddits have volunteer moderators, there are many examples. Um, but I think one way that I've been looking at in my research to try to facilitate community self-governance and this accounting for context for people to get involved in um, these kind of decisions is to look to restorative justice as a potential model that um, could be useful, uh, taking some principles from restorative justice, which uh, in case anyone isn't familiar with this framework, Briefly, it's about supporting the person who was harmed. That's usually the central thing is like, how can we help the person who was harmed? Doing things to repair the harm. And ideally, what's really exciting um, about the framework is ideally we're also looking at changing the conditions and or the attitudes of the people who caused that harm in the first place. So this is kind of about the learning opportunity that we're often missing in current content moderation frameworks. Um, and currently restorative justice in the United States is most common in schools as like diversion for young offenders and sometimes lower level crimes. I won't get into all the details, but I will put in the chat. Um, an article that I've written with my co-authors. This is just a short piece to explain what does that look like to apply restorative justice online, potentially. Um, it sort of exists currently uh, in a lot of different ways, often not uh, called restorative justice because this is a framework that comes from um, activists, criminologists, uh, social work, a whole different set of people that are not necessarily the same people uh, who are doing online moderation. But some of the work that's emerging about this shows that especially smaller, attentively moderated communities, often volunteer moderators, they are invested in doing things that look like restorative justice. It involves uh, supporting people who've been harmed. It involves onboarding new members and helping them learn rules and learn the norms, uh, developing norms and rules together, changing them as the community changes. So you're probably all wondering, how does this scale? How do we scale something like restorative justice? Um, I think in part, it's an aberration that we look at these giant uh, platforms and see that there are not uh, systems of local control. If you look at many criminal justice systems uh, in the offline world, we have local courts, we have uh, lower courts, higher courts, we have local judges, you serve on a jury. Um, None of this is perfectly working, of course, uh, but it exists as a system of um, smaller local units that are connected in larger ways. Uh, one of the technical terms for this is subsidiarity. I will paste in another article if you wanna learn more about that. This also comes out of work with the co-author. There's an academic article linked there too if you want the longer version. Um, but of course, this, uh, this form of structure, I think, really pairs nicely with restorative justice, um, potentially. And I'll just respond briefly to something that came up in the Q&A, is that I totally agree um, that if we move to this kind of self-governance, uh, to supporting it more, this can't just be companies saying, oh, go moderate yourselves. Um, this is empowerment, especially for youth, right? Like, this needs to be resourced. This needs facilitators. This needs training. Um, and then I also kind of compare it to uh, an offline space where uh, when you serve on a jury in some places, you're supposed to be paid by your employer or whatever. So there's different ways that you can be compensated for uh, participating, but it's also seen as sort of a civic duty um, to participate in the governance of the spaces that you exist in. Um, so I'll just end by saying that uh, I think it's really interesting that social media platforms are completely unlike other consumer products. Um, so that was mentioned earlier today as well. It's not like buying iron bars, right? Uh, it's totally different. And I think we're still at the beginning of figuring out what does it mean to democratically participate in these spaces rather than just sort of um, being the consumer, or in other words, uh, being being ourselves the product. Our data, of course, is the product of these platforms. So how do we how do we foster a more democratic uh, participation? So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hazanov, and thank you again, uh, Ms. Heller and Duick. Uh, so we now have some time to take some questions from uh, the committee. Um, so if uh, I have anybody uh, in the room interested in asking a question.
So in the meanwhile, I can get started. Um, I'll start with you, uh, Ms. Duick. Um, I was thinking about, um, you know, um, this thing about accountability theater, right? And, um, and that a lot of times what um, solutions a lot of these platforms offer feel like really um, they just want the problem to go away or they want, they are trying to come up with like a band-aid solution. So um, it, um, I agree that when we think about content moderation, there is need for a multi-stakeholder perspective of which the platforms are a very important stakeholder. I'm kind of curious to hear from you, like how, how do we incentivize these platforms to think about real solutions, to, to think about accountability in a way that is not just banded solutions that give this impression of accountability theater? Uh, law. Um, I think is going to be the answer to that. Um, I think, um, you know, I think they're really, uh, that's a sort of flippant answer. And, and so I should take a step back. I mean, I think there's a really important role for self-regulation here. Uh, and I've written a lot about it. And I think it is really important. Um, and that's for two reasons. First of all, um, you know, at the scale that I mentioned, um, platforms are always going to be the front line of responders to content moderation. There is no government capacity or expertise to do content moderation in, uh, uh, in, in at that kind of scale. And also, uh, for a second more important reason, we would, should have very deep constitutional concerns about the government being involved in speech regulation or content moderation, as we might call it, um, in, in that way. And so there, you know, in, in America and in the United States, where I, uh, where, where we all are, there's a particular, you know, First Amendment um, looms very, very large and will uh, pose a lot of problems for many uh, legislative solutions that, that um, are proposed in this space. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean that nothing can be done. Absolutely not. I don't, I don't believe that. Um, but it does mean that there's always going to be a vast area in which companies are going to be operating in ways that they can't, uh, and making decisions that can't be um, uh, regulated directly. And so I think law is going to be a very, very important part of incentivizing platforms to do, um, to, to make uh, better choices. Um, you know, I think that um, <laughs> whether, uh, the, the question now is not if law will play a part, but what what kind of part law is going to make there, uh, what is going to play, because there is legislation, um, you know, I can't keep track <laughs> of how many regulators want to do something in this space. Um, I, I uh, when I first started my, my doctoral dissertation um, some six or seven years ago now, I had this idea of studying like global regulation of online speech and like now it's just like, I want to study, you know, one state's regulation of, of online speech or, or one country's um, because there's just way too much uh, to keep track of. If you take, you know, the 50 states and then the federal government and then, you know, just things are going, uh, things are really happening in Europe as well. And so um, law will play a part and it's about making sure that that, that part is, is productive. And that's one of the areas where I have uh, have concerns because I think I see this model that we that I was talking about about like in um, requiring sort of individual accountability mechanisms or mechanism uh, um, transparency reporting mandates that are sort of based around how did you apply these specific rules to specific cases and you have to give uh, users this specific kinds of reasons uh, in ways that don't really incentivize that systemic. Uh, thinking those system design principles uh, and allow platforms to sort of uh, do many of the things that they already do, produce the transparency reports they already produce, which are these aggregate numbers, which are useful if you want to give a presentation and recite some statistics about how many pieces of content Facebook took down in the third quarter of 2022, but they're not necessarily so useful in knowing, you know, were those decisions correct? Did that re reduce harm on the platform and all those sorts of things? So um, I think, uh, you know, um, we um, and so so that is the question here in terms of making sure that we incentivize making those systemic design choices rather than those um, sort of individual um, reporting and 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 um, accountability due process mechanisms that result in this kind of theater. Yeah, I mean, I I I think regulation will certainly force the platforms to, to um, be incentivized for this. But I think you touched on this uh, a little bit and I, I find myself thinking about it as well, which is uh, regulation of 
which country are we talking about, right? And, and they, there could be widely different implications of that because a lot of these platforms are very global um, and that complicates it. Uh, but thank you. This is this is very helpful. Um, I want to come to you, Ms. Heller. Um, thank you for talking about, uh, I would say, a new and emergent technology, um, um, which often goes, you know, less discussed in circles where we talk about content moderation. And to me, I mean, I it was very insightful to me when you spoke about how it actually happens that speech, there is an automated speech to text transformation that happens before it goes to these further automated algorithms that look for problematic patterns that need to be moderated. And we know that a lot of these automated systems kind of build in errors and mistakes in that mm -hmm. process. So by the time you go from the beginning to the end, I mean, you don't know where things are getting missed or the opposite of that, which is, is something that is not problematic is that getting unnecessarily moderated? So it kind of feels to me that, um, and you mentioned that that you know these these uh, algorithms, automated approaches have their limitations, and uh, humans have their limitations. How do you see it? It kind of seems that humans and algorithms need to work together to make it better, especially in these some of these emerging technologies. How do you see that happening, or do you see that making a difference to the current landscape? That's a really good question. I think the way that it makes a difference and actually has a, a helpful impact is if we look at the terms of service that are being developed for XR platforms and make sure that they have a basis in neuroscience. And by that, I mean, um, if, you have a, uh, if you have a gun in a VR environment and it, and the, the, it gets reported and what is the right met, what is the right rule to apply to it? If it was web-based social media, it might be glorification of violence or, um, or a violation of uh, prohibitions against violent um, conduct. When you look at it in an XR context, it actually doesn't matter if it's a photorealistic gun or a gun that looks like it's animated from Roger Rabbit. Your brain responds to the act of violence, not the resolution of, and uh, character of the image. So if the, if the terms of service are written to focus on the fidelity of the image, you're looking at the wrong factor. There's a lot that we don't know about how our brains operate in this environment. Uh, I'm actually uh, soon to join the, the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab as their, their first um, policy and, and, and legal researcher, which is separate from the, the experiments we all run there. But um, the, the type of work that, that I've been doing um, has been, I, I'm doing interdisciplinary work testing what visceral notice looks like in XR. So it's not just a theory in a law paper, but so we can actually see what makes users more aware that their eyes are being tracked. Uh, I've been publishing about how privacy law does not fit the, the XR legal regime because privacy law is intended to protect your identity. And that's not what's at risk here. It's the, um, it's the inferences that can be made from biometric data. And those type of inferences can give insight into a user's health or um, likes, dislikes, and preferences, their sexual orientation, their, whether or not they're telling the truth. Tons of information that it, I think has a, a big impact on human rights um, and, and not just science and commerce. Because if we try to censor our thoughts and are afraid that this technology will make improper inferences or try to sell us things with targeted, targeted advertising based on our involuntary reflexes, it, it seems like that gets at the core of freedom of expression. I've gotten a little far afield from your question, but I, I think the way that we make content moderation work in virtual reality is to take, start with the foundation of social media, but do not um, do not let ourselves get stuck there. 
because this is an entirely new type of computing that impacts our bodies and our minds differently. Certainly, absolutely agreed. Um, I do see some uh, questions coming up from uh, the committee. Uh, over to you, Stephanie. Thank you for that. I just wanted to follow up on that point. You know, one of the tasks of this committee is trying to define what social media is, because that is the, the mission. <laughs> and there's a lot of, uh, it's fuzzy. Um, and so given the space that the three of you work in, I was wondering if you wanted to weigh in a sort of what is social media as you conceptualize legally in augmented spaces, because, you know, uh, the mention just then was like, we think focus on social media, but VR matter. But where where does that distinction happen? Um, I'd love to hear some thoughts about sort of how you conceptualize that construct of social media, what is or is not within that umbrella. See, normally people ask me what the metaverse is. That's a much better question. Um, I think that when you're when you're looking at XR environments, uh, XR to me includes AR, VR, and haptics, um, which are kind of sensory affordances that um, pieces of hardware that get, that get put on. Um, the the latest and coolest one is smell-o-vision, to give you an example. So that's not necessarily a part of social media, but social VR is its own mechanism, and there's lots of platforms that are emerging to allow users in different physical spaces to interact within a computing environment. And that's what I would think social media looks like in, in XR. It's, it's more the character of the interaction rather than the, um, the specific XR platform, whether or not it's AR, VR, or, um, or mixed reality, which is a, a blurring of the two. Jen. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, may, uh, maybe continuing on this, uh, 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 speaking to uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 Britain. Uh, uh, so um, I was uh, curious if you can uh, tell us, so we're concerned about risks of social media, including, I guess, uh, you know, uh, XR. Um, um, any risks that you think we should be in particular, uh, for maybe like unique to, uh, youth and, and kids uh, that we should be uh, sort of paying more uh, attention to? The, the jury isn't back yet on whether or not XR is appropriate for children. We, we know a few things. We know this is the, the best tool for learning humanity has ever developed. You, you absorb it much more when it's experiential rather than text-based auditory. It kind of blows all of the ways we understand learning out of the water. But at the same time, these devices are, are graded for children 13 and up. The reason is because we don't know how this in, impacts children, not just their social development, but their spatial development and, their, and other types of um, of reasoning that children have. I put my 101 year old grandmother in my headset and I, I put her at the bottom of the ocean interacting with fish. And I asked her uh, what happened afterwards. And she said, it was amazing. A turtle flew by me and a blue whale swam by and I looked it in the eye and there were jellyfish everywhere. It's incredible. It's the best thing I've ever done. It's one of the highlights of my life. And I said, Grandma, that is so interesting to me because what really happened was I sat you in a chair and I put a computer on your face that had six cameras. That's what happened. And so if somebody with that much life experience talks about, gets wrapped up in the immersive aspects, we don't know how that affects a child who may have, uh, you know, has to develop the ability to discern what is real from what is imaginary. The other part that I would be concerned about, and I'm a new parent, so I'm, um, I can't wait for her to play with things, but not yet. Um, right now, if you, if you talk to Philip Rosedale, who created Second Life, which was one of the first XR platforms, and it was a, it's a social media platform in there. Originally, that platform was 20% adults, and they have a long, like a long, um, long time user base. And most people have had their accounts active for 10 years or more. In, in what we call the metaverse or virtual worlds or XR today, 
80% of users in social platforms are children. So these platforms are being used by children, but they're not necessarily designed to keep children safe, designed to cater to how, how children socially interact. Um, and they're being designed as commercial mechanisms. I, I've written a lot of papers about targeted advertising, what it looks like in XR, because it does already exist, and how I think it, based on the science, we shouldn't allow it. Um, so I, I really, I, I'm really wary about children in the metaverse. The first XR experience that has been approved by the FDA as a medical advice device, not the hardware, basically the equivalent of the software, is actually a, um, a program designed to treat lazy eye in children. And it's very effective. Children don't need surgery. It works in about six weeks. But the headset itself is graded for people 13 and above. So to me, it's a question that scientists and user communities are going to have to grapple with sooner rather than later, if even medical experts are, are creating ambig ambiguity. Thank you. All right, um, Ms. Hazanoff, I wanted to come to you. You spoke about uh, restorative justice as sort of an underlying principle for platform governance and uh, you also alluded to sort of some of the challenges that uh, such a framework could pose when you have to kind of do content moderation at like the scale of millions, right? Can you talk to us about what some of those those could look like that we could apply this uh, justice, social justice framework, but also kind of tackle the large scale of you know content that needs moderation on these platforms? Yeah, I mean, I, I hope more research will come out uh, that provides more concrete models. So my answer is going to be a little bit unsatisfying because I don't I don't know of any plug and play ready models that exist. Um, maybe one day I will get a big grant to create one, but so far not yet. Um, so the, I don't know of anything that exists that's like ready to go. Um, I think what's inspiring to me is to look at a couple different things that already do exist. One being restorative justice in schools, um, because I think it provides um, a way to think about uh, this is something that's been implemented for a couple decades. In some cases, it's been evaluated. Um, it is not perfect. There are critiques uh, of restorative justice used in schools to um, try to get expulsion rates down, for example. And I think that's a huge uh, problem that platforms would likely replicate without um, uh, policy and law telling them that they cannot use it in that way because in my uh, brief conversations with platforms about restorative justice the main thing that they are interested in is of course how do we keep people on the platform right we don't want to kick them out of the platform in the same way that a school does not want to expel students for various uh you know altruistic and financial reason reasons so this is by no means um an easy or perfect solution but i think um there are definitely concerns that we can learn about by learning about the critiques uh, and the issues of RJ as it's been implemented, implemented in a school type setting, because I think that gives us um, some sense of both like what can work um, and also what the potential pitfalls are that we need to look out for, because it cannot be about uh, centering the person who caused the harm and just having them click through an apology box uh, to say, oh, I've apologized, because um, sometimes apologies can be part of restorative justice, but they cause more harm if they're insincere. Um, and that, that has been studied. And so we simply can't have a, a, a platform just run away with, with RJ uh, without maintaining those core principles of we have to center the needs of the person who was harmed. It, there are ways um, to think about doing that. The other place that I look to is, is really smaller platforms, uh, nonprofit platforms where people have had to develop their own systems of moderation. And again, I would love to see more research on this. If anyone, by the way, knows of good research uh, on these topics, I by no means have all of it. So please 
send me stuff. Um, or if you know of any interesting um, small platforms that have developed their own systems, I would love to, to hear about that as well, um, because I'm always looking for good, uh, good examples that I could potentially study. So you do see these kind of principles happening in, in smaller communities, but I, I don't have like a toolkit that I can just give you that's about how to do this online. I can certainly share a lot of resources that I've found that are about how communities can implement restorative justice in an offline setting that I think can be applied in so many ways online, but um, I think that work is still new and emerging, um, but I think it's exciting to, to think about it and contemplate how it might be helpful. Um, I think you asked something about scale as well that I probably didn't address. Um, I, I but, think that's fine, but you know, you you brought up the point about uh, the offline uh, learning from some op offline implementations. Um, I'm kind of curious about it because I think one of the biggest hurdles that I see like this restorative justice frameworks facing online is for perpetrator perpetrators. It is easy to hide behind certain easy platform affordances like anonymity, like creating multiple accounts and using bots and so on. So, you know, um, any thoughts on, on how those platform, how specific technical affordances and features complica complicate um, yes. using the framework? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I have a better answer for this question. Um, and it relates to one that came up in the Q&A. Uh, someone asked, what about someone with an antisocial personality, right? Um, and my thoughts on that is, if someone is an antisocial personality or they are anonymous online and we can't reach them, um, restorative justice can certainly still be useful in these cases because sometimes the person who caused harm is not even part of a process. And if that person is anonymous or unwilling to participate, maybe they have a personality disorder. I don't know, that psychology is not my thing. Um, but whatever it is that like is making them not able to participate or willing to participate, Restorative justice can be very powerful because it can help the person who was harmed by involving community members. And one of the frameworks that I find really useful is um, victim's interests, and this comes from criminology, um, about what, if, what do people who've been harmed need? And sometimes some of the things that they need is affirmation from the community that something bad happened to them, that they were harmed, and that that harm matters. And that, when you survey people empirically and do interviews, for not everyone across the board, but pretty universally, a lot of people, for them to move through and heal from harm, like knowing that your community supports you and says, this thing that happened to you was bad. We don't agree with it. We think it was wrong. We acknowledge your, your suffering and pain and we support you. That can be so powerful that it doesn't even involve the anonymous or unwilling to participate person. And I think that's um, a really important and useful uh, power that, that a, a good uh, principled RJ kind of process can have that, that we see so rarely on in content moderation. Uh, we see so rarely um, that even happening. And even to the extent that we look at a criminal justice process in an offline sense, there is, if a conviction happens, there is that sense from this institution that has power has said something bad happened to you, the person who did it was in the wrong. We at least get that despite all the problems with the criminal justice system, right? When there's a conviction, there's that message from an authority that like something bad happened. Sometimes with content moderation, you make a report and you never, you never even hear back of like what happened to the thing you reported. So I think RJ does have a lot of potential there in terms of helping people who've been harmed much more than current uh, content moderation does, even when we can't reach the person who caused harm for whatever reason. Thank you, Ms. Kazanov. Uh, Miguel, I, I see you have a hand up. Yeah, so just following up on, on that topic. So what would you do? What would you like to highlight uh, out of all these structures that you explained to us and, and restorative justice that, that would be particularly important for children in social media and, and youth, right? Because this concept applies to everyone, but I think that, that if we are able to target down to, to children, uh, it would be very important for us. Thanks. Sure, yeah. I think with children in particular, I would go back to that aspect of it being a learning experience. And I do think this is important for adults too, but especially for children because of the developmental phases that we're in as children, that participating in creating rules 
can be such a valuable learning experience, whether those roles are online or offline, but we're talking about online here, right? So what, it, what would it mean to participate in deciding what should our rules be? How do we enforce them? What do we do when someone breaks a rule? To really have those conversations within online communities, I think would be so important for children because there's such an important developmental process there to be sort of enculturated into what is it, what is okay to do online? Because it's one thing for Facebook to give you the rules and for you to be told, follow these rules, right? Uh, it's a whole nother thing to have a conversation, an ongoing conversation about what do we value as a community? And I'm including children in that, right? What do we as children value for our online space? And I'm saying this as when we think about children, this is going to be most likely facilitated by trained adults in a, you know, in a meaningful way, but that children can really, that the children have values, children have ethics and to honor those values and ethics and to help them think through what is okay, what is not okay, and to have that be about learning. So I think if you ask what is the one most important thing, I think for me it would be that that learning aspect that is so important uh, for children. Thanks. Sharon? Um, thank you. And this is uh, again for you, Amy. And you started uh, addressing this at the end of your, um, your uh, statement. Um, um, so I'm really curious to hear from you uh, what are what are the right mechanisms or strategies to, uh, for platform accountability for these sort of self governance and, uh, kinds of uh, approaches you mentioned like putting resources so that seems like maybe one like they actually need to commit to putting some resources in this but are there other mechanisms uh, what are what are the accountability measures we can we can uh, expect from platforms. That is a fantastic question that I do not have an answer to, but I, I love the question and it totally makes sense. Um, I think I can expand a bit on the resources that I think are necessary, um, because as I said, every time I talk to a platform about this, they, they love the idea until I say, you can't do this with bots, by the way, and they say, oh well, we'll get back to you. And then I never hear from them again. So um, I think like trained facilitators is really the most important thing um, in terms of how to do this correctly, right? Like people that have social work training, people that have training in being, if, if we're talking about children, uh, child psychologist training, like those types of things where they're trained in these kinds of facilitation, because I think um, the temptation for a platform at least the ones that I've briefly talked to, is that they think like, okay, this is just a way that we can outsource moderation to the users, right? We don't have to pay for anything. We don't even need to develop these bots, which is like expensive and complicated, right? We can just like tell the users to do it themselves. I don't think that works. I think it needs to have um, humans. I mean, the short answer is humans. Like we need humans who are trained, who can help other humans do these things, right? Like again, looking at an offline example, when we have a criminal justice system, like judges go through many years of training before they can be judges, right? Lawyers have to be uh, certified by uh, the Bar Association. Uh, I'm not alert, but you need to be uh, certified by the Bar Association to be a lawyer, right? Like you need to do, you can't just, you don't just do it, right? And to, to you, you arrive on a jury as a just a citizen of that jurisdiction, but you're part of a structure, right? Um, my answer is probably very unsatisfying and abstract, but I try to look to like, these things exist offline and we've created this whole other online world that doesn't have any of these mechanisms of accountability, of subsidiarity, any of it. It doesn't, it's so um, rare to see it in these online um, cases, but uh, the, the short answer is really humans. Uh, there's probably a policy thing that could encourage platforms to do this, but I have not started that research at all because um, I don't have any answers on what kind of policy could be like a federal policy that would say users need to have some participation in their self-governance. If anyone knows of anyone who's doing that work at a policy level, like send me resources, I would be fascinated. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer, but you're asking the right question. I can say that. Thank you so much. Can I just follow up on that very quickly and referring to something that Ellen had said in terms of the number of sort of uh, moderation decisions that the platforms need to make. So I'm curious, are you seeing, I mean, it seems like a challenge. So I definitely see that we need humans to do this. 
uh, any sort of yeah, I, I guess there when I when I think about that, the scale problem sort of pops up in my head and thinking through how do we find that uh, the the right uh, trade off any any sort of uh, insights there would be much appreciated. Yeah, I mean, my my initial thought is like I'm not against robots helping us. Um, and so I think a lot of that moderation that happens like the really easy cases, maybe robots are appropriate. Um, but I think the harder cases, we need humans. Um, and so I think, you know, we've created a, a world in which platforms are allowed to scale infinitely without many checks and balances. And we're, we're reaping the consequences of that now. Um, and so I think if we can, um, if we can think broadly and, and in a bigger sense of like, what might it mean to create some more boundaries, to make things smaller, to scale things for humans. I think that would be great, but I am under no illusions that that would be easy from a policy perspective. Thank you very much. Yeah, we are almost up on the uh, hour, so we'll try to close out this panel. Thank you to all three of you, Ms. Uh, Heller, Duick, and Hazanoff. We enjoyed uh, these conversations. And I'll turn it over to uh, Sandra. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Moon for um, moderating. And thank you to all our panelists. It really, it was a super interesting conversation. And thank you for everything you do. Um, uh, we're going to uh, close this uh, open session. I want to thank the committee again for um, a lot of time devoted to thinking about this topic. I want to thank the National Academy staff who, who really did an excellent job of curating a set of um, um, uh, really interesting speakers. And to everybody who has uh, joined us for these open sessions. Everybody, have a good evening. Have a terrific weekend. Take good care. Bye-bye.